Stillman and Company, 1025, 1063 The Game, streaming live on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook Live. We are live from the Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning Game Nashville Studios, Bridgestone Arena, where the Predators tonight try to clinch their way into the 2024 Stanley Cup playoffs. They just need one point. But let me say this. It will be very depressing, in my opinion, very depressing, if the Predators end up clinching and they lose in overtime against the Winnipeg Jets tonight at 7 o'clock. Barry Trotz right here at 5 o'clock. Ian is here today. Hello, Ian. What up, what up? So I want to start today because we got a lot to get to today. Apparently Calipari left, uh, recorded like a hostage video to send to UK fans, which I just think is hysterical. But I want to start with this today. Fear-mongering. We all know what it is. Oh, if you don't vote our way, they'll get you. It happens all the time. And I've always told people when it comes to the NFL draft and it comes to the month of April specifically, don't listen to what somebody says. Follow what they do. They tell you with their actions what their plans are, not with their words. So yesterday I had some Titan fans that were tweeting me saying, oh my God, Jared, look at this tweet from the Chargers. They're going to take Joe Alt. Oh my God. Because the Chargers Twitter account posted Andy Bischoff. Ian, before I sent you the grid this morning, did you know who Andy Bischoff was? No. I have never heard of Andy Bischoff before. In fact, they had no context to this tweet. Other than him talking, I had to look it up. He kind of looks like a young Tim Corbin. I had to look up the coaching website of the Chargers and go guy by guy to figure out which guy this was. Andy Bischoff, the uh, tight ends coach and run game coordinator, I guess had a media availability yesterday, and he spooked out Titan fans with this video that the Chargers social media team posted to Twitter. This is going to be an O-line centric building. You know, when it comes to our strength program, it's built around the O-line. You know, everybody else fall in line. And so uh, some people don't value offensive linemen. We do. Okay. And that will be shown in how we approach everything from how we stretch to how we lift to how we run the ball to how we protect. Uh, this is a place where O-linemen are going to want to come and play because it's an O-line centric space. Uh, where we're going to raise these guys up and make them feel great about what they do and what they have to offer and not push them to the side and make them the afterthought. They are at the forefront of our thinking. We are going to be an O-line centric team. Let's cut that clip from Andy Bischoff and put it on Charger Twitter. Why? Because they want teams like the Titans or the Jets or Chicago or whomever that could use offensive line help, they want you to see that. They want you to be scared. They want Rand Carthon, if he really covets Joe Alt, they want him to have to use a pick in next year's draft to try to move ahead with the Chargers so that they can't get their guy. It's fear-mongering. That's what it is. And I think there's a, a second reason behind it as well, which we'll get to. But that kind of talk about we're an offensive line-centric organization and Jim Harbaugh at the owners' meeting saying everybody's job is affected by the offensive line. The offensive line is the most important part of a team. Really? The Chargers were the best job on the market of all these open jobs that were available. You want to know Why? because they had Justin Herbert. Everybody knows quarterback is the most important position, and if you're the Chargers, everybody knows that you're going to be a Justin Herbert-centric team. But remember, that's talk, and this is lying season. So when the Chargers tweet out a video of some random guy just sitting there and saying, hey, you know, we're gonna be all offensive line all the time, you guys get scared. I don't. Why? because their actions have told me that the Chargers are not going to take Joe Alt. I take what's going on with LA, because again, this isn't the first time this has come out. 
In fact, I came back from the Super Bowl and I was like, hey, I hear Harbaugh wants to build it in the trenches and they could be interested in Joe Alt and this could happen, that could happen. And then all of a sudden, everybody else started saying the same thing, independent of me, which made me think I'm not the only one at the Super Bowl that heard that message. What I take the Chargers trying to tell everybody that they're going offensive line as is we want you to think we're drafting an offensive lineman, which means that they probably aren't. Remember, Charles Robinson says that the J.J. McCarthy hype started because Jim Harbaugh, his head coach in college, just constantly pumps him up all the time. And then we've heard all the rumors that the Chargers want to trade out. So now it's time for the duck theory. The Chargers have a left tackle. The Chargers, by the way, also have a right tackle on the roster, Trey Pipkins. Why would they draft another left tackle? The Chargers have a franchise quarterback. They don't need J.J. McCarthy. And yet, they traded Keenan Allen, they cut Mike Williams, and Quentin Johnston, who currently is their number one wide receiver, has 38 catches in his career. He basically had the same rookie year as Traylon Burks. The duck theory. If it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, chances are it's probably a duck. It doesn't look or quack like the Chargers need offensive line help. They clearly don't need quarterback. And again, the rumor is they want to trade out at five. So if the rumor is and all the talk in lying season is they might go offensive line or they might trade out, they want Marvin Harrison Jr. That's what this is all about. Jim Harbaugh has probably lusted for Marvin Harrison Jr. from afar when he was coaching against him at Michigan. And he probably knows that Marvin Harrison Jr. is the, what, second, third best player supposedly in this draft? And so what Jim Harbaugh is doing, it is he is talking up everybody except the guy he wants in Marvin Harrison Jr. Think about it. He's got the fifth pick. J.J. McCarthy was his quarterback. If he convinces everybody that J.J. McCarthy is all that in a bag of chips, just like Caleb Williams, just like Drake May, just like Jaden Daniels, and it goes quarterback, 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 he gets any player he wants. Marvin Harrison Jr. Maybe he likes Malik Neighbors, but it's one of these receivers. So the long story short is do not buy the Chargers BS. They are not taking Joe Alt. Is it possible that one of these teams picking in the top six drafts Joe Alt? I guess it's possible. Is it possible that one of these teams that needs a left tackle long-term, like the Jets, trades up ahead of you with the Giants or trades with the Chargers or Arizona? Is it possible that they do that in order to get a left tackle? Sure it is, but you're not going to trade three first-round draft choices, which is probably what it would take, or at least two to get from 10 to 5 to draft a left tackle. You'll do that for a quarterback, but you're not going to do that for a left tackle. Not when you've already got one on the roster. Not when you know you're going to be rebuilding your team after this year because Aaron Rodgers probably isn't going to be your quarterback. So don't get scared about the Chargers. The Chargers are not drafting Joe Alt. The Chargers are telling everybody, we, the way we stretch is going to be about the offensive line. The way we eat is going to be about the offensive line. Here, let's just post a cut of some random bozo up there telling you how much we love the offensive line. Why? Because we want everybody to see it. We want everybody to know we want offensive line here in L.A. Remember last year when Indianapolis told everybody at ESPN they wanted to draft Will Levis with the fourth pick? And because I liked Anthony Richardson more than I liked Will Levis, I just assumed they're lying. That's just not true. If everybody says they're going to take him, they're not going to take him. That's how it works. Washington has the second pick in the draft, and they essentially have the first pick because we know Caleb Williams is going number one to Chicago. 
Do you have any idea who Washington wants to take? I don't. Think about that. We got all this info that the, the Chargers want Joe Alt. But we don't have any idea between May and Daniels who Washington likes. I don't have any idea who New England likes. And other than wanting to rip somebody off in a massive trade, I don't know who Arizona likes it for, if it's Marvin Harrison, if it's Malik Neighbors. Some people are now saying Roma Dunze is up there. But when somebody tells you over and over and over again ahead of the draft that they really want something or that they like something or that they're going to be about something, they're not telling the truth. Just like Rand Carthon, when he told everybody ahead of free agency that they weren't going to go out and spend a bunch of money, and then the Titans turned around and unloaded the war chest, which I'm happy about, by the way. But again, that's telling everybody one thing and then doing the opposite. That's how this draft works. So don't buy the Chargers BS. They're not going to draft Joe Alt. In fact, Ian... I'm going to do this. I'm going to guarantee it. Dun, 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 dun. I guarantee the LA Chargers will not draft Joe Alt with the fifth overall pick in the draft. Done. Don't buy it. When I said that they put up a cut of some random bozo up there. And if you don't think that a micromanager like Harbaugh is telling the social media team what to do, then you do not understand just how crazy this khaki pants wearing guy is. When I saw that and I'm like, who is this guy? Why are Titan fans sending me this tweet of the tight ends? I didn't even know who he was. I had to look him up on the website of him saying, we're going to be an offensive line centric team. We're going to build around the line. I'm like, okay, they're drafting a receiver. They don't have any receivers on their team. They're drafting a receiver. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. Now, there are two fears I have when it comes to Joe Walt and the Titans. Because, again, I think it's like 95% likely Alt will be there with the seventh pick. In a lot of drafts, he wouldn't be. But in this draft, because of the quarterback and the way the teams are falling... I think there's a 95% chance Joe Walt's going to be there. There are two separate fears I have when it comes to the Titans' ability to draft Joe Walt. We'll get to that next. 615-737-1025 if you want to weigh in. Again, our phone number, as always, 615-737-1025 here on Stillman and Company. And uh, let me tell all the fine folks out there, Preds fans, do not miss tomorrow night's Smashville Live show at Brew House 100 in Bellevue at 6 o'clock. Ryan McDonough and Luke Shin will be the Preds special guests. You can get autographs and pictures with them. Smashville Live is brought to you by the Black Abbey Brewing Company and ESPN Bet Sportsbook.
even in a game where we got battered up front and Joe got sacked nine times and probably hit 15 and, um, you know, we really outside of one drive and one explosive play didn't really do much in that game. And we get a turnover late in the game and now they're going to play, play two man and Jamar goes and wins versus two man and wins the game. And so those moments have always stuck with me when, when a push comes to shove, do you want to have someone that can go score touchdowns and go win versus tight coverage? Um, and in that debate, the Sewell chase debate, which was again, two players that you knew, whichever one we take is probably going to be a 10 time pro bowler, first team, all pro style player. Mm -hmm. And Panay was fantastic and we loved him. And Jamar was fantastic and we loved him. And the debate went back and forth and back and forth and which one do we need? And I just, that I landed on the Jamar chase side because I saw what he could do for our offense. The difference there to me is like Jamar was an elite player. And in that moment for our team in Cincinnati, the elite player that can score touchdowns versus the elite player that can protect the quarterback with the style of quarterback that we had and the style of offense that we ran, we took the guy that could score touchdowns. Hey, yeah, that was Brian Callahan the day after he was hired on our show saying, and this is where that came from again, the elite touchdown scorer versus the elite non-touchdown scorer, Jamar Chase, and Panay Sewell. So I have guaranteed that the Chargers are not drafting Joe Walt with the fifth overall pick, and I think there is a 95% chance that Joe Walt is available when the Titans go on the clock at seven. The 5% that he's not on the clock is probably just my natural skepticism. But the Giants have three tackles, so I don't see them drafting a tackle. The Chargers have two tackles, no wide receivers. The first three teams need quarterbacks. The fourth team wants to trade out. And by the way, yesterday a lot of people got mad because I said the Titans had below average receivers. So today what I did, Ian, I literally went through the entire league and kind of stacked them. Okay. Arizona's receivers right now I put as nobody. Mm -hmm. They're one of two teams that when I looked at the receivers, Chris Moore – is one of their two best receivers, which I think qualifies as nobody. So if Arizona picks with that pick, it's going to be a receiver. So, uh, I mean, unless, again, somebody you know, climbs up two, three first-round draft choices in order to draft a tackle, which I don't think they'll do, Alt should be there. And I think it is 95% or excuse me, 90% likely that Joe Alt will be drafted by the Titans. 10% of me thinks that he won't be. And the 10%, I think, can be split into two separate and, yes, equally important reasons, each at 5%. The first reason is I could see the Titans convincing themselves that one of these receivers, neighbors or a Dunze, is too good to pass up. Marvin's probably not there. Because, again, I think if he's there at five, the Chargers are taking him. And so I could see if Neighbors is available, let's say four quarterbacks go, and Arizona trades out. I mean, it's hard for me to imagine that two of the receivers would be there, but let's just, for argument's sake, say that Neighbors or Adunze. I could see that there's one of these two guys that the Titans just think, oh, I mean, he's a game changer. We got to have him. I mean, we, we can't. And because it worked in Cincinnati, I can see Brian Callahan wanting to do the same thing here. It's like when somebody gets a new job and the thing you always hear out of that person is, well, when I was at Johnson and Company, what we did, it's always, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That person that never stops talking about their last job so much so that you're like, if you liked it so much there, why don't you just go back there? And I could see Brian Callahan wanting to do the same thing here. The second reason that I could see the Titans passing on Joe Alt would be that the Titans, when it comes to grading these guys and ranking these guys, see that the drop-off from Alt to Olu Fashnu or Troy Faltanu is not that big of a deal. And so the Titans are telling themselves, hey, we can trade this seventh pick, and there's a dance partner there in the form of a Minnesota or a Denver or a Las Vegas and so, hey, we're going to move back to 11, 12, 13 
but we're going to pick up a one in next year's draft, or in the case of Minnesota, we're going to pick up another one in this year's draft, or we're going to pick up a two and a four and a three next year, and so we're better off with the three players than we are with the one really, really, really good left tackle. So for me, those are the two reasons why Joe Alt would not be a Titan, and again, I'm putting those at 5% each, with the 90% confidence I have that the Titans are going to draft Joe Walt. And I get both opinions, right? I get the opinion. You know me. During the year, I kept saying, every time I flip on LSU, this Malik Neighbors makes 13 different... I mean, he's incredible. I was the one who was saying that. I was the one who was saying, hey, I think he's better than Marvin Harrison Jr. and Robbie and Joe. Like, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you start to hear more people are coming out saying, hey, I think I might prefer Neighbors to Marvin Harrison. But I disagree with both opinions, too. Because at this juncture, when it comes to the Titans and what they need as an organization, and I'm not talking about need the position, though they do need the position, but they need those pillar players. They need those franchise guys. And alt, to me, is the sure thing. And I'm not passing up the sure thing if I get the opportunity this year, given where my team is as a whole. 615-737-1025 Our phone lines are driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com One texter into the text line Says great Now that you guarantee Joe Alt will not be taken by the Chargers He is absolutely Going to the Chargers That one texter says Ian Pull the guarantee list okay, I want to see second. How we've been doing lately on these guarantees. Because you guys, I think, just want to crap on that. Oh, yeah, Jared, every time it's not. I mean, I think I'm batting like 85%, maybe better, okay. lately on my guarantees. Let's see. How far back would you like to go? Fall of 2023? Is that too far back? Let's see. Jared Fall guarantees October. Let's go, to, let's go to whenever Forsberg signed his contract because I know I got that one right. Oh, that's too far? That was pretty far. All right, let's yeah. go. Let's this go to when Simmons signed his contract. Because I guaranteed that one too. Okay, let's see. Jared guarantees the Titans will re-sign Jeffrey Simmons. That was Thursday, uh, February 16th, 23. That was correct. And then Jared guarantees Duke will beat the Vols in the second round of the tournament. That was that was, that was wrong. That was and then we had a couple of stack house here. Um oh, another a couple of wrong ones here. Jared guarantees that Hooker will go in the first round of the draft. That was bad. That was wrong. But Jer I got the Stackhouse one right. Got the Stackhouse ones correct. Bang, Jer bang, bang. Jared guarantees that Lamar Jackson will never get to an AFC championship game. Oh, That was God. wrong. But then we got a couple of good ones. Jared guarantees Hopkins will not sign with the Bills or Chiefs. Thank you. Jared guarantees the Titans will cut Michael Badgley. Thank you. That was... Jared guarantees the SEC will not win the national championship in football this season. Cha-ching! Jared guarantees that Alabama will beat Tennessee. Bingo! Also correct. Uh, Jared guarantees that Atlanta will beat the Titans this week after the buyer trade. That, that was, was incorrect. Miss. Jared guarantees that Derrick Henry will not be traded before the deadline. Cha-ching! Jared guarantees that Jerry Stackhouse will never make the NCAA tournament at Vanderbilt. Bang! Jared guarantees that the Minnesota Wild will beat the Preds on Thursday, November 30th. That was right. That is correct. Um, Chiefs will beat the Dolphins wild card weekend. Freezing cold. Correct. Chiefs will beat the 49ers in the Super Bowl. Correct. Um, we have an open-ended one. Let's see. Jared guarantees that Vandy will fire Stackhouse at the end of the season. Correct. Jared guarantees the Vols will make it to the Sweet 16. Correct. Damn! I'm on fire! So, uh, a little bit of a rough stretch there. During the draft last year, so be careful about your draft guarantees. Um, but uh, overall, not too bad. I mean, how many in a row is that? I feel like it's like eight in a row. That was, let's see, one, two, we have an open-ended three, four in a row. And then an in incomplete, another incomplete, correct. Oh, I don't know. That's, pretty good. That's a pretty good stretch there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven with two incompletes. In a row. I guarantee Joe Alt will not be drafted by the Chargers with the fifth overall pick. I guarantee it. Don't worry about it because, again, I've been on fire lately with these guarantees. And let's not forget, I was the one person in town 
with no sourcing, no inside info that's like something's going on there with Mike Vrabel. The one guy, everybody else, oh, no, Amy said they're going to keep Vrabel. Uh Uh-huh. I'm just saying. 615-737-1025. We'll get to your phones. Plus, there's one draft prospect that everybody's starting to like right now that for the Titans, I am starting to not like. We'll explain what that is. Get to your phones, and we'll do it next. Here on Stillman & Company, tune into 93.3 Classic Hits today for the Sounds as they take on the Memphis Redbirds on the road. Pre-game, 6.30. First pitch, 6.45. Coverage also available on the app and at 93.3 Classic Hits Dot com Sounds Baseball is presented by Twin Peaks, Family Leisure, and Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning.
What, prior to the process, has Troy Fautanu from Washington not been outstanding in, from the tape to the pre-draft process involving the Senior Bowl, the Combine, the Pro Day, all we've heard about him on the private workout and 30-visit scene. What has he not done at an incredibly high level, in your opinion? Anything? Nothing at all. He's a great player. He's one of my favorite players in this draft, uh, Troy Fautanu is. And at left tackle, so why can't be a left tackle? Well, why can't he be? His arm length is better than Joe Alt, right? Yeah. So you think about uh, Troy Fautanu, left tackle, right tackle. We know he can be a great guard. He's got the skill set to be a phenomenal Pro Bowl guard. I said if you're going to talk comp, it was Zach Martin. Zach mm. Martin played left tackle at Notre Dame exclusively field and seamlessly moved to guard with the Dallas Cowboys and he developed into a Pro Bowl caliber player. Troy Fautano is a guaranteed Pro Bowl player. Now, I don't think he'll be a Pro Bowl tackle, but he'll be serviceable and good. I think he'll be a, certainly a Pro Bowl caliber guard. I ask you, Field, I have him in the mid-first round in Mach 4.0. I won't tell you what team, but in that mid-first round area, how high could he go? That was Mel Kuyper Jr., and they're talking about, oh, Troy Fautanu, he is the man he is. Now, we should say, the biggest ch difference between him and Skaronsky is that Peter Skaronsky has little baby arms, and Fautanu has the Willie Stargell bat arms. You know, I mean, they are long, which is important for some of these people, you know, these coaches and the tackles and everything else. But Troy Fawatanu's on the list. I think that the Titans are taking a left tackle. And I think it's either going to be Alt, most likely, Fashnu, number two, and then kind of Fawatanu and Mims are kind of there after that. And look, all I hear are good things about Troy Fawatanu. And when we talk Troy Fawatanu, we're talking about trading out of seven, picking up picks, and then later you know, using a pick on Troy Faltanu. Here's why I can't get excited about Troy Faltanu. Everything Mel Kuyper Jr. just said in that cut that we played, they said last year about Peter Skaronsky. Now, I'm not one of you morons out there that says, I don't care about Legereus Sneed's knees because they said A.J. Brown had bad knees. But, when I hear that this guy might be a great guard, but an okay tackle, I already have that on my team. And they're making me play him at guard. So I don't need two of the same guy. I already got that guy. And he already plays guard. So I don't need him. So the more I hear that kind of stuff about Fautanu, the more I'm like, eh, pass. Fashnu, yes. I'm in on Fashnu. Mims, he just hasn't played a lot of football, but he's got the measurables and the size. And again, you know, if you can play tackle at Georgia, you can play in the NFL unless you're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs like Isaiah Wilson. And then obviously Joe Alt. I mean, you know, there's nothing else I got to say about Joe Alt. One texture says, if Alt is available at seven, you turn the pick in as soon as the Giants pick is announced. If Alt isn't available, then you entertain a trade back. So I have been informed that our draft show, Thursday night of the draft, it is incredibly unlikely that the Predators will have a game that day. So we will have a draft show that night right here on 102.5 The Game. And Ian, as you know, the 102.5 The Game draft shows are the ones that really go off the wall. They're fun. I mean... It gets late and it gets wacky. It gets wacky. And then last year, the meltdown I had when the Titans drafted Skaronsky, like... People love that stuff. The meltdown when they drafted Monty Rice and Dylan Radens, that was all-time stuff. It's going to be me, Derek, Chris, and Trevor. Trevor will be with us for draft night. Awesome. So we, I mean, that's what we're going to, if Joe Alt's available at seven and the Titans do not take Joe Alt, if that's the case, you may have the largest meltdown we've ever had in the history of the 1025 The Game Draft Night program. Because I think I've done every single one of them since I've been here. And so I, I know a meltdown when I have one. And I just feel like, man, if that pick, if, whew, if it goes quarterback, 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 receiver, receiver, or quarterback, 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 receiver, you know the Giants, so another receiver, you 
And it's, look, no disrespect to Roma Dunze, but, like, this team needs alt. I'll go crazy. Indy Ben says, you do know the Chargers have an early second round pick too, right? They could see value in taking alt in round one if they like him better than neighbors or Adunze and then still get a wide receiver in rounds two or three. The Titans are an extremely lucky franchise if Alt falls into their lap, fitting exactly what they need, which is stability at left tackle. He's not as good of a prospect as Quentin Nelson was, but he represents a safe pick who should be solid throughout his career. He's absolutely a better prospect than Quentin Nelson. You know why? Ian, why is Alt a better prospect than Quentin Nelson? He plays tackle. Because Quentin Nelson is a guard. That's why. And again... Only people, like last year this happened when the Titans took a freaking guard with the 11th overall pick. And people were like, no, 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 Jared, this is the new NFL where the center of the pocket is important. No, it's not. Tackle. That is the important position. Tackle. Oh, Jared, did you see the money Robert Hunt got? Clearly, interior of the offensive line matters nowadays. No, the reason Robert Hunt got that money is because the Panthers' offensive line is so bad that the moron owner there was like, I want us to fix the offensive line or I'm going to throw my drink at you. And they said, okay, he gave us a gazillion dollars. Let's go sign whoever we can. And there were no tackles to pick from who were any good. That's why if Trent Williams was on the market, they'd have given all that money to him instead of Robert Hunt. But they had to do what they had to do. And I also, you know, this idea of, well, you know, the Chargers could just trade back and then later take a receiver. No disrespect to Brian Thomas Jr., but he ain't Marvin Harrison Jr., okay? Like, that's the, you know, that's kind of the thing here is like, there's a reason why neighbors and Marvin Harrison and Roma Dunze are thought of high, better than everybody else because those guys are supposed to be the Jamar Chases and the Calvin Johnsons and the Randy Mosses and the that's what we're talking about here. Larry Fitzgerald, like that's what we're talking about with those players. Amon Ross St. Brown is a really good wide receiver. He's not Justin Jefferson. That's the difference. One texture says, hey, Jared, is there anybody in the draft that you would pick at seven if available other than Joe Alt, even if Joe Alt is also available then? I mean, like, Caleb Williams? I mean, like, you see what I'm saying? Like, no. If Alt's there, I think you'd take him. I would take him over Harrison. I know that, you know, some people think that that's crazy. I would take him over Harrison. Na I like neighbors more than I like Harrison, and I'd still take him over neighbors. Kyle's up next on Olu Fashion. Thank you for calling and thank you for waiting. What's up, Kyle? Hey, guys. Uh, Path of the Draft today um, is featuring Olu Fashion from Nigeria and everything. So if you want to watch, that'd be good. Um, what would you think about um, trading back with the Bears maybe to nine and picking up Alt still or Fashion and getting a third round pick for that? That would cover the speed or this year's third round pick. We can sure. get one. So to your point, Kyle, that's not a bad call. Thank you for it. So when somebody say, you know, if the Giants take Alt, you got to right then and there run the card up there. The one thing that you could do is you could call Atlanta at eight and say, hey, we're going to take Dallas Turner. And you could play chicken with them on the phone knowing that you're not going to take Dallas Turner. You could play chicken with them if they really want Dallas Turner or if they really want Roma Dunze. You could play chicken with them to get them to jump to say, okay, we'll give you a third. And then that way we make sure that we get Roma Dunze and that you don't get on the phone with somebody else like the Bears, to your point, to then give them Roma Dunze. But you do run the risk of this. If you drop down to nine, because there is a chance that you could drop down to nine. If you drop down to eight and alt's on the board, you know you're getting alt. So then you're picking up a pick and you're still getting alt. So that, in theory, you could do. It's, I mean, it's like really time consuming. Like it'd be really hard to pull that off, like to convince Atlanta that you're going to do something else and then call other teams so that it sounds like you're going to do something else and then get Atlanta to bite so that you, like it's hard, I think, to actually pull that off, but maybe it works. But if you get to nine, Let's say you flop with the Bears, like Kyle said. If you get to nine, now you do run the risk of the Jets at 10 going to eight. Because 10 to eight is not as big of a jump 
as 10 to 4 or 10 to 5, obviously. 615-737-1025 is our phone number 615-737-1025 I got a quick Preds thought we'll get that in there here on Stillman and Company as we are live at Bridgestone Arena where the Predators can clinch tonight hey tune into 94.9 the fan today is Vandy Baseball takes on MTSU pregame at 345 first pitch at 4 o'clock Vandy Baseball brought to you by Smoky Mountain Tops your countertop experts visit SmokyMountainTops.com What's the biggest thing you learned about the Central Division teams this year? Um, you know, I've been in the Central It's It's always been, and maybe I'm biased because I played in the Central. It's always, in my opinion, the best division in hockey. Um, and the parity, especially the top teams, are, you know, I think right now this year, you know, the three top in our division is as good as anybody that we played all year. Um, and they all have different challenges. They, they play different styles in a lot of different ways, but um, they're as good as there is. There you go. That was Andrew Burnett today. The Predators can clinch a playoff spot with one point tonight right here at Bridgestone Arena. So I just want to say this. It'll really suck 
if the Predators lose in overtime tonight and it's like overtime losses in hockey suck because you're right there and it's usually some kind of mishap in overtime in which you lose the game. Like it sucks when you lose in overtime because you were so close and then it's like, oh, well, you get a point and it's like, oh, man, that's a loser talk. So then to be, oh, man, you lost to Winnipeg in overtime but you got a point so you made the playoffs and so just kind of take a little bit away from the excitement of making it back to the playoffs. Now, let me say this. This year, I think making the playoffs, when the Predators do it, is going to be worth celebrating. I don't think making the playoffs is that big of a deal. This team pretty much does it every year. And in both the NHL and the NBA, if you don't make the playoffs, you suck. Like last year, the Predators didn't make the playoffs. They didn't make it by an eyelash. And they kind of sucked last year. So if you don't make the playoffs, you suck. When I hear them wanting to expand the NHL playoffs, I'm just like, why? So you can expand it like the basketball tournament and have nobody talking about it at the water cooler, and you know, like that kind of thing. But again, that's a different discussion for a different day. But I am going to celebrate this year's playoff accomplishment because this team feels significantly different than the 2022 playoff team that made the playoffs barely at the end of the year, got housed by Colorado, and it was like, well, nobody except Joe Rexroad predicted we'd make the playoffs, so we must have to celebrate this even though we couldn't compete. That year it was a bad thing that this team made the playoffs because after they made the playoffs, they convinced themselves that they were right there, and they were not. And even in 2021, because while the Predators got hot at the end of the 2021 year, the shortened COVID year and everything else, they were never going to beat Carolina and they were never going to beat Tampa Bay. This year's different. Because this team's got the juice. Like, they've got the, they've got the ability. They've got... You know, I know Adam Vingen wrote an article at Sportsnet today about, you know, the analytics say maybe they peaked too soon and... This team has got the it factor with them. And they won't be favored against Winnipeg, and they won't be favored against Vancouver. And quite frankly, I don't think they should be favored. I mean, excuse me, against Dallas or Vancouver. And quite frankly, I don't think they should be favored against Dallas or Vancouver. But they absolutely could beat either one. This team's got good goaltending. This team has good top line scoring. I mean, that again, I'm not going to argue that this top line could go up against anybody's top line because this top line is not Edmonton's top line. But it's pretty good. And Ryan O'Reilly is a playoff player. During the trade deadline, I was listening to a lot of Sirius XM and NHL radio, and they kept talking about how if you want to win the cup, you've got to have that anchor of a defenseman back there. You've got it. Goaltending, which Edmonton does not have, which Colorado does not have, which Vegas does not have. You've got it. And by the way, I don't know if you watched the last week, because I always talk about the Sorrow Sucks crew that's out there. You know, the people on Twitter that every time he gives up a goal, they complain about him. Soros was absolutely phenomenal. Sunday night at Jersey. I mean, you won that game. He, he stole that game. Like, you win because of him right now. He was great Tuesday against Boston. He was great Thursday against St. Louis. Like, he is getting on his game. And so in 2022, I remember when he got hurt. It was probably towards this time of the year. They played a game at home against Calgary, and he got hurt. And that day when it happened, I said, oh, here comes the excuses they're going to get knocked out of the first round of the playoffs. They're going to get embarrassed. They're going to get knocked out of the first round of the playoffs, and it'll be, oh, Jared, it's not John Hines' fault. You know, it's uh, just if we had had our goalie, it would have been different. And so I was actually kind of depressed when they made the playoffs in 2022 because I felt like that sold the team and the decision makers for the team. It sold them fool's gold. Well, this year, You've got a team that can compete with anybody. Now, the word compete is not a synonym for beat. Because sometimes I'll say they can compete with Dallas and be like, oh, Dallas is winning six games. That doesn't mean you didn't compete. 
In 2015, you made the playoffs, actually had home ice advantage against the Chicago Blackhawks, had a 3-0 lead in Game 1, blew it, had a 3-0 lead in Game 4, and blew it, and had a lead in Game 6 and blew it. And that Chicago Blackhawks team went on to win the Cup. And so while you were out very quickly into the playoffs, that was a team that was good enough to compete. And the next year with the same core, that team got to game seven of the second round of the playoffs. And then the next year, that team was in the cup final. Like this team is like those teams. This team is not like the 22 team where making the playoffs was almost a bad thing. It's not like the 21 team where it was like, great. This team went on a heater. It was incredibly fun. Pecorine had that last moment in the sun but they're probably not going to be able to beat the Carolina Hurricanes or the Tampa Bay Lightning if they play them in the first round of the playoffs. This year's different. And I'm just going to tell you guys right now, I heard the midday show right before I hopped on, and they were talking about, well, you know, it's important to win these games because you got to stay ahead of L.A. and Vegas because if you stay ahead of L.A. and Vegas, then you don't have to play Dallas, and Dallas is on a heater, and Dallas is, you don't want to, I want Dallas. I'll tell you right now. I want the Dallas Stars. I want the Dallas Stars because the Predators are going to have a week off before they start the playoffs. I don't know when Dallas's last game is, but there's always kind of like a bye period between the end of the season and the playoffs. It's kind of like Major League Baseball for those teams that win the division and they don't play in that wild card series. It's like six days off. Well, that allows everybody to reset a little bit but Dallas, is, they're going to win the President's Trophy, and they're not going to be worried about you. They're going to be thinking about Colorado. They play Wednesday the uh, 17th. So they play Wednesday the 17th and probably wouldn't play again until the 21st. So they'd have four days off. They're not going to be worried about you. They're going to be thinking about Colorado. And all you got to do is go on the road and take one. And this year, you played them very tough, except for the 9-2 game. And they're going to remember the 9-2 game. It was the last time you played them. They're going to be thinking about the 9-2 game. You're going to be thinking about the 9-2 game. And I think that's all a good thing. So tonight, if the Predators win and they make the playoffs, or if they lose in overtime and they make the playoffs, this should be celebrated. But that does not mean that every playoff appearance should be celebrated. But this year's different. This team has got some juice. This team's got a shot to win some playoff games and to give us a fun spring and maybe even go on a run. And I really believe it. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. 615-737-1025 here on our program. Coming up next. So, I was surprised what I heard from Rick Spielman. You know I love him. Former Vikings general manager. The guy who, in his last draft as GM of the Vikings, drafted Justin Jefferson in the first round. And he was comparing wide receivers in this draft and was asked about Jamar Chase and Malik Neighbors. And I was a little shocked by what I heard. And it made me think about the position the Titans could find themselves in and what might Brian Callahan want to do. We'll do that next. Stillman & Company, 1025-1063 The Game. Let's talk about Lee Company and the fact that they've got uh, the 10K Power Play Giveaway. So enter for a chance to win a Kohler Home Generator or $10,000 towards Lee Company Home Services. That's right, a Kohler Home Generator or $10,000 towards Lee Company Home Services. Go to leecompany.com slash giveaway. That's leecompany.com slash giveaway. Contest, uh, contest entries are accepted until Saturday, April 20th.
Still in the company, 1025, 1063, the game streaming live on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook Live, live from the Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning Game National Studios, Bridgestone Arena. Predators tonight looking to clinch a playoff spot against the Winnipeg Jets. Again, one point will get it done. Barry Trotz will join us at 5 o'clock. So I have been listening religiously to Rick Spielman, the former Vikings general manager. He's got a podcast with the first pick. It's a CBS podcast. He's on Sirius XM. He's a co-worker of mine there. He's a really good guy, and I find him to be incredibly insightful. And I think he did a good job as general manager of the Vikings. And his last first-round pick, was Justin Jefferson in the 2020 NFL Draft. And I'd say he hit that one out of the park. I'd say they did pretty well, right? And so, on the latest with the First Pick podcast, he and his co-host Ryan Wilson were going over comps for wide receivers. For instance, he says that Marvin Harrison Jr. reminds him of Larry Fitzgerald. Brian Thomas Jr. out of LSU reminds him of George Pickens on the field. Xavier Worthy out of Texas reminds him of Jamison Williams. And then they got to Malik Neighbors. And his partner, Ryan Wilson, on the CBS podcast, said that he's, his comp for Malik Neighbors is Jamar Chase. And I was fascinated by what Rick Spielman would say, and here was how Rick Spielman responded. Do you have any issues at all with my comp of Jamar Chase? Yes. Really? Yeah. Wow. All right, what's your issues with that comp? I think that Neighbors is a little bit quicker twitched and can bend a little bit better after the catch. Wow, okay, that's high praise. So I think he's a little bit better uh, with the ball in his hands than when Chase came out. Jeez, oh, pizza, man. That's that's some um, Caleb Williams-type praise for Malik. Okay, all right, I'm going to ask you to <laughs> – I'm going to ask you again, coming out. And you have the fourth pick or whichever pick, the first wide receiver off the board. Malik, Marvin, or Jamar? What, how rank those guys? Oh, Jamar, Malik, Marvin. Marvin, Malik. I can go either way. Okay. I, but, I still have 17 days, but Jamar's number one. Okay. Now, at first, I was a little shocked when he was like, no, I, I don't like that comp because I actually think Neighbors is better with the ball in his hands after he catches it than Chase. But then said that he would still take Chase coming out over those two receivers. Which takes us to kind of the conclusion that I have that those guys are up there. Remember what Brian Callahan said? Elite touchdown scorers versus non-elite touch or non-touchdown scorers? Yeah, let's go ahead and put Malik Neighbors in that category. So the Titans hosted Malik Neighbors for a visit yesterday. I don't think Malik Neighbors is going to be available with the seventh overall pick, but here's the thing. Everything has got to be decided before draft night because if you don't prepare for every situation before draft night, you end up with your pants down, and we're not going to do that on this program. So here's the question that I have when it comes to Neighbors, and that is, if he's right there with Marvin Harrison, as Rick Spielman said, if he's even better after the catch than Jamar Chase is, is he an elite touchdown scorer worth taking over Joe Alt, who is an elite non-touchdown scorer? And let's say for argument's sake that they're tied in terms of their grade. You know, Floyd used to say seven is the best you could get. And that Eddie George as a prospect was a seven. Or that Marcus Mariota was a prospect as a seven. And again, Mariota was the second pick in the draft. So I know he stinks, but like, let's, again, as a prospect, he's very high. Let's say they're both sevens. Elite, one guy scores touchdowns, the other guy doesn't. Then who should the Titans take? And here's what I'm going to do, because I think this is a fascinating debate. In fact, I think that Brian Callahan, if this is the case, and these are the discussions that are going to be had right now inside St. Thomas Sports Park. I'm telling you, there's going to be meeting after meeting after meeting in which they are going to discuss scenarios that will never happen on draft night. But they're discussing them now because they need to have them hashed out before they get to the war room on draft night. These guys, at least they shouldn't, just 
fly off the handle and say, oh, uh, this guy. No, you plan these things out. So here's what I want to do. I want everybody's opinion on this, and then I'll make my own opinion, which is what I think the general manager should do, right? There's all these different guys in the room. There's the scouts. There's the area scout. There's the cross checker. There's the director of college scouting. There's the assistant general manager. There's the director of personnel. There's the head coach. And it all kind of funnels up the GM. In fact, Bill Polian said that in their room, there were 10 people in the 1998 draft. Five voted Ryan Leaf. Five voted Peyton Manning. Well, I've got eight people that we're going to figure out this debate of if the Titans are on the clock at seven and there is the elite touchdown scorer in Neighbors versus the elite non-touchdown scorer in Joe Alt, who do you take? The votes. Trevor gets a vote. He'll be on today. We'll ask him. TD gets a vote. He'll be on Thursday. We'll ask him. Chris Sanders gets a vote. He'll be on tomorrow. We'll ask him. Fitz gets a vote. He'll be on the show tomorrow. We'll ask him. Corey Curtis gets a vote. He'll be on the show Friday. We'll ask him. Chad gets a vote. He'll be on the show on Friday. We'll ask him. Ian, you get a vote as far as the elite touchdown scorer versus Joe Alt. Neighbors or Harrison versus Alt. And the fans will also get a vote. Now, I don't know how Brian Callahan feels in this particular situation. And the other thing I would say about the 2021 debate, and I think that Brian Callahan, you know, he really went out of his way. When I asked him after he got hired about, hey, you know, picking there at seven, you might be in that similar Chase Sewell situation of 2021. And he said, yeah, you know, it seems, but he kept couching it with every situation is different. Did not want to back himself in the corner, and I get that. But I think that if Neighbors is there, or if Marvin is there, I think there is a legitimate shot that this is, in fact, the exact same discussion. I mean, remember, he said, in Cincinnati, they looked at it and said, We've got a 10-time pro bowler at receiver, and we've got a 10-time pro bowler at tackle. It kind of feels like Alt's that kind of prospect. It kind of feels like Harrison and Neighbors are that kind of prospects too. It does feel like a similar debate. Now, Cincinnati did have that choice. But they, know they weren't for sure what was going to be there at five. So in this case... You might have to make that choice on draft night, not expecting it. So, again, we got eight votes. Trevor, TD, Ian, Chris Sanders, Fitz, Corey, Chad, and then I got one for the fans. You guys get a vote, too. And we're going to do this the way the Tennessee State Legislature does things, which is the guy who's in charge just goes, I'll say aye, aye, I'll say nay, aye, ah, uh, eyes have it. That's how we're going to do it. The feel I get from you guys for the text line. I'm not counting it. I'm not. We're just going to, whatever I feel like the vibe is, and then that'll be eight. And if it's tied, I break the tie. That's how we're going to do this. But as I was thinking about that 2021 debate that they had in Cincinnati, that of course looks like a genius decision, right? Because Jamar Chase has been so good for the Bengals. Do you think Detroit regrets that? Because Detroit ended up in the NFC title game. Panay Sewell, who they drafted with that pick, might be the best offensive lineman in the NFL. And in that same draft in 2021, in the fourth round, they drafted a receiver by the name of Amon Ra St. Brown. And I think Amon Ra St. Brown has worked out pretty well for the Lions. And we're told this is a deep receiver draft. And so while I hate the idea of, oh, well, we don't need to get Roma Dunze, Jared. We'll just wait until the third round or fourth round and get a receiver. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, the receiver you're getting in the fourth round is not going to be Malik Neighbors or Marvin Harrison Jr. or Roma Dunze. But at the same time, 21 was a deep receiver draft, and the Lions didn't take a receiver 
They took the tackle, and the tackle might be the best lineman in the league, and they took a receiver, and he's the number one receiver. He's not as good as Chase, but he's good. 615-737-1025, which is our phone number. Ian, would you like to wait to cast your vote later in the week, or do you want to cast your vote now on this particular draft discussion of if they're both there, neighbors and alt, do you take the receiver or do you take the tackle? Would you want, do you want to vote now or do you want to wait? Um, I can vote now. I think right now my vote is for alt. Okay. That's one on the board. Ian goes Joe Alt. Trevor will be on later. We will ask him, and of course, we'll get your phone, 615-737-1025. And there was another thing that Field Yates and Mel Kuyper Jr. talked about that I do think fans have to understand, because the Titans are going to have a shot to pick one of these receivers and probably Joe Alt, even if it's a Dunze, who I don't think gets as much hype as the other two, but there are some people that think that a Dunze might be the best guy in this group. But there does feel to be an argument that Mel Kuyper and Field Yates brought up that I do think people need to hear. Like, just kind of the state of the draft and the receiver position. Oh, it's a deep. We'll do that next. Here on Stillman and Company, Chase and Big Joe have your chance to qualify to win a pair of tickets in the Eurostone Club to see Jeff Dunham this Sunday at Bridgestone Arena. This contest is brought to you by Green Trees Company, a family-owned cannabis company and dispensary providing high-quality, legal THC products for anyone seeking medicine, relief, or wellness, located in Hendersonville and a new location in West Nashville and available online at greentreescompany.com. Tune in tomorrow between your chance, uh, between 9 and 11 a.m. for your chance to qualify. And let's not kid ourselves. Green Trees, plus the Eurostone Club where the food is all you can eat, and a comedy show. I'm just saying. 615-737-1025, Stillman and Company, 1025, 106 of the game.
and we believe that teams are going to be angling to move up to pick number four to craft a quarterback. Here's the risk that I think that Monty Austin Fort, their GM, runs, is that we know if he moves down from four to, let's say, 11, where Minnesota is, he is going to get a mountain of picks. And with a team that still has a lot of needs and that still has a quarterback who, although he's been around for a while, is young enough where you can play a little bit of the long game here, Mel, you may say to yourself, acquire as many assets as possible. But go check out that wide receiver depth chart right now, Mel, and it is not going to scare anybody. And while this class has so much depth at wide receiver, I believe, and I don't feel like I'm speaking, uh, I don't feel like I'm being out of turn and speaking for you as well, Mel, the difference between wide receiver three and wide receiver four is significant. Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, all should become special players. There's a chance that A.D. Mitchell and Brian Thomas get there as well. But those first three, to me, feel like it's about as safe as it gets in the NFL draft. If you move from four to 11, I think you're missing out on all three of those guys. There you go, that was Field Yates on the first draft podcast. Mel Kuyper followed that with a similar like, yep, that's the case. I mean, there's a huge drop off after three. So the, oh, we'll just go get a receiver later if we don't take one of these guys. I mean, look, maybe they become A.J. Brown. But these three, Harrison, Neighbors, and Adunze, they're in a different class. And when it comes to receiver, again, it'd be nice to get a good receiver. But the one that, I mean, I, you know, the one guy, you, you want one of the great ones. Like today, Joe was talking about how great Calvin Ridley was. And I know I made a lot of people mad yesterday. But like Joe was talking about how great Calvin Ridley was. Calvin Ridley's not a number one. He's your number one. But he's not a number one in the NFL. He's not Tyree Kill. He's not Jamar Chase. He's not Devontae Adams. He's not Terry McLaurin. He's not CeeDee Lamb. He's not, th- like those are Justin Jefferson. Those are the number ones. These guys are supposed to be that. So keep that in mind. The other thing I will say, and I feel like we do this too much when it comes to the NFL draft. But I feel like what happens is people just say like, oh, well, uh, you know, we just, we need a tackle, so take a tackle. And we're treating the tackles or the receivers like they're all the same. Brian Thomas Jr. is not as good as Malik Neighbors. So you're making a choice, for instance, if you're the Chargers at five, using them as an example, if they trade out to 13 and they take Brian Thomas Jr., you're making a choice to get a worse player. Well, we got a receiver, but not all receivers are the same. But then again, I'll flip this around the same way. It feels like Joe Alt is in a class all, his, all, all by himself. I saw somebody on Twitter yesterday said, I don't understand why the Titan fans are Joe Alt or bust. You know, Fashnu and Latham are good too. I'm like, yeah, but they ain't Joe Alt. They don't check every box like Joe Alt. Trevor's sitting here saying Latham may have to move inside to guard, and Fashnu is really talented and good. But every time we read a scouting report on him, especially from those college coaches that talk to Bruce Feldman, there's always a but. Phones are driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. And again, you guys do get a vote on this wide receiver versus alt discussion. Elite touchdown scorer versus elite non-touchdown scorer. Caleb and Gallatin says they need to take alt. Especially, he says, after signing Calvin Ridley. Wide receiver no longer became the highest priority after that signing, and the Titans desperately need a left tackle. Thus, it's an easy decision for me. It's hard for me to say that because, again, while I like Ridley, and he's a good player, he's not a number one receiver. I don't think it's an easy decision. Right. Regardless, you know, the texter said it's an easy decision for me. I don't think it's very easy, but... It's close. They just showed a shot on TV. Now, I guess they were showing D- a Jaden Daniels highlight, but they had been talking about Malik Neighbors, and they just showed a whole shot at Missouri where Malik Neighbors got behind the defense. Jaden Daniels underthrew the ball. Malik waited for it, like came down to crouch down to get it like Derek Jeter fielding a ground ball and then ran into the end zone for a touchdown. I'm like, guys, that's not a good play. Like, that's not something that I would say, oh, yeah, you know, that one, there you go. Oh, yes. Boy, the text line really liked my talk about the comedy show and the 
green trees, read whatever it may be. One texter says, don't matter what wide receiver you have, the quarterback is on his back. Yeah, I mean, I heard that. I, like, everybody's got that graphic where there's the picture of the quarterback with nobody blocking for him, and the wide receiver's got his hand up saying, throw me the ball. And I remember it was the same discussion in Cincinnati, and Cincinnati's offensive line was terrible. Joe Burrow got sacked nine times in a playoff game. I've told everybody that if Floyd were to be resurrected from the grave, the first thing that I would tell him is that the Titans sacked the quarterback nine times in a playoff game and lost because I don't think he would believe that. But the Bengals do not regret that decision. And your coach does not regret that decision. So it's easy to say, like, well, it doesn't matter. Joey from Bellevue says, got to protect the quarterback. Levis doesn't have time to throw. No receiver will matter. That's not what your coach thinks. Like, your coach thinks that he can scheme up ways for the quarterback to get rid of the ball before the rush gets to him. Now, I'm skeptical of the ability to do that because they didn't really do that with Joe, and Joe is a different player than Will Levis. No disrespect to Will Levis, but he ain't Joe. Terrell says he would take neighbors. One texter says, how do you know Levis is the quarterback of the future if you don't take Joe Alt? If you don't take him, you might need a quarterback left tackle and right tackle next year, and Rand won't have a job to fix this mess. That comes from Patrick. So, as of right now, I think the Titans have done a decent job, decent at setting Levis up to prove whether or not he's going to be the guy. I was thinking about this yesterday because the offseason program began and Will Levis is QB1 and the, and the Titans posted a video of all the players, you know, going in for the first day and Levis was the first guy and I watched a podcast over the weekend with Carson Palmer where Levis talked about how, you know, he's excited that this year he's the guy and he'll get every rep in OTAs and he'll be the leader and it's not Ryan Tannehill's team anymore, it's his team and all these things. And if I had any advice for Will Levis, it would be, this is your only guaranteed one of these. Because if he stinks this year, they will go get another quarterback. I mean, I know it may not be fair, but this is the NFL. The NFL ain't fair. And I do think there's a chance that if the Titans end up not getting him a right tackle, that it may not matter, and then when you lose, everybody will just say, oh, well, Levis isn't that good. And to that point, I do think to right now, the Titans have done a decent job trying to supplement Levis with something that would make it look like he's got a decent team around him. Now, I can't get too excited about it because they don't have a right tackle. And unlike left tackle, where they have the seventh overall pick, I don't see the path to right tackle. And if they use the seventh pick on a right tackle, then they don't have a left tackle, and that's an even bigger problem. And I still wish they would have signed back a Chris Moore. Now, I know they brought back NWI, but I really wish they would have signed back Chris Moore, who could run, you know, just to give Levis a little bit more just in case you don't draft a receiver in this draft. Blake says you can't score touchdowns without protection. Again, your coach thinks he can scheme up protection. Can he? I'm skeptical of that. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. Ian... I have a Rex rant of my own to get into. Okay, fine. I have, a, I have got to Rex rant on something. That's next. Let's talk about the Tennessee Men's Clinic. That's right. The Tennessee Men's Clinic, you've put this up for way too long, folks. It's time to get it done and move forward with your sex life, and the Tennessee Men's Clinic is the leader in bedroom confidence. The reality is pills often quit working, and guys start making excuses for why they don't end up in bed? Did you know that studies show that men will be more irritable and argumentative before bed just to avoid failing at intimacy? And I know a lot of you hate going to the doctor. But the Tennessee Men's Clinic was created in 2014 to take care of guys just like you. For a decade, the, the urologists and providers at the Tennessee Men's Clinic have helped guys with ED and weight loss, and they now even offer aesthetic enhancements and cosmetic procedures. Their ED and weight loss treatments truly change lives, and with no surgery, they are seeing success rates as high as 90%. They specialize in seeing guys who think they're out of luck regain hope that they can be successful in the bedroom and beyond. And they even offer same or next day appointments. Guys, it's time to feel amazing and hit your goals this year. 
So call the Tennessee Men's Clinic at 615-208-9090. That's 615-208-9090. Or go online to TennesseeMensClinic.com to book an appointment today. That's TennesseeMensClinic.com. Andrew Hurley is not going to run it. He's going to hold it. First time he's listened to Dan in years, huh? <laughs> Six point six on the clock. Andrea Hurley. The rest of the Hurley family. What an amazing run! It is a Yukon coronation. The Huskies make history, back-to-back -back national champions. Okay. Ian, did you stay up last night to watch a championship game? Yeah, for the most part, yep. You watched the end of it? I mean, halfway. I'm impressed. I'm a little surprised. Did you enjoy it last night? At the beginning, yeah. I mean, I thought it was an okay game. It was back and forth. It was interesting to see Purdue and Edie and UConn try and handle that. Yeah. So, I kind of watched it. I mean, I watched the Braves first, and I would flip back and forth between the two, but I was primarily on the Braves. And then when the Braves watched, lost, or, yeah, lost, and then that game was over, I got in the bed, I flipped it over, and, I mean, I fell asleep, but I woke up. I, whatever. And so this morning, I wake up of what I consider to be the most boring NCAA tournament of my lifetime. I wake up, and there's Joe just ranting and raving about college basketball this morning on the Rex rant, 
Joe went off on this hypothetical Tennessee versus UConn matchup. And listen how into the game. See, this is my problem with college basketball because I think college basketball kind of sucks now. And I think it's kind of boring. And I think it's become Major League Baseball. But these, these basketball writers, these basketball bennies, they just think that this game hangs the moon. They've become the new baseball writers. Like Jason Stark, if you go up to him and say, hey, man, most Americans don't care about Major League Baseball anymore, he'd be like, oh, how could you not? It's America's pastime. It's like, yeah, just don't hear many people talking about it the way they used to. Same with college basketball. But not our morning show where Joe was just rolling about this hypothetical Tennessee versus UConn matchup. I mean, let's be real. So let's go to the matchups. Josiah James, he erases Alex Carabon. That's a great matchup for Tennessee at the four. Zakai Ziegler's all over Tristan Newton like Purdue had no chance to be. Santiago Vescovi flew free by now. That's a good, good size matchup for Cam Spencer. But even better than that, Jemai Meshek comes off the bench, and he's all over Spencer. And he's probably all over Newton, and you can throw him on Stephon Castle. You've got defensive matchups on the perimeter that are totally different than what Purdue was doing last night with their drop coverage and just basically had to let the guards have their way. Tennessee is pressuring. Tennessee is all over UConn. I'm very fascinated to see how that works out. And Jordan Ganey off the bench is key, too. Meshack plays a ton. One guy from UConn last night, Diara, played more than five minutes off the bench. The Vols have more depth. They have more they have the athleticism to match up at different spots. The big issue, yes, it is at center. Of course, I haven't gotten to that yet, but let's get to that. Donovan Klingon is not Zach Eady. He's not 74304 with a with a polished, efficient post game. But man, I I, I was kind of sad last night thinking of what could have been. Okay, so I listened to that whole thing, but I was watching it on YouTube today. And as I was watching it on YouTube, my favorite part was Robbie and Joe were not in the same spot. Robbie was just literally staring off into space while Joe was going through the matchups of this hypothetical Tennessee versus UConn game that didn't happen. And I was laughing my ass off. So with that, I, if I could, I'd like to have a Rex rant. If I could, Ian. Sometimes he wakes up on the wrong side of the bed. And sometimes he's just, well, Joe. Awkward moment. Let's do it. This is the Rex Rant. Now on Robbie and Rex Road. Oh, this is so frustrating. He's kind of ugly, though. Okay. Here's my rant. College basketball. Whether you are the NCAA, the committee, CBS, the coaches, the players, or the binnies, the writers that just, oh God, let's break down this hypothetical UT-UConn matchup. Men's college basketball sucks right now. That was the most boring tournament of my lifetime. Now I watched, but I did not watch with intent, right? Like, the only game that happened that, and it's different on a local level, talking about UT getting to a Final Four, but I mean, I'm talking about, like, water cooler talk, everybody watching the, watching the games, and then talking about what's going on here, and the sister genes of the world, and things like that. The only game that mattered in that tournament that was a <gasps> game, in my opinion, was Kentucky getting beat by Oakland. Like, that was, everybody was talking about Kentucky getting beat by Oakland. The other games, they were good games too. Like, Alabama, North Carolina was a good game. But nobody was talking about it after it was over. Purdue, Tennessee was a good game. NC State had a magical run. But nobody talked about it like VCU getting out of the first four and into the final four. This wasn't, it just didn't have any juice. It's like the games were on, people watched them, and then they woke up the next day and they went to work and they cared about other things. And I cannot explain to you how bad that is for the sport other than to tell you that that is horrible because I have seen this happen before and this is where Major League Baseball is. When I was a kid, Major League Baseball had water cooler talk. It had juice. And what happened was, 
all of a sudden, once the steroids got out, and so there wasn't all the talk about Barry Bonds or Alex Rodriguez or Roger Clemens or anything else, and the Red Sox and the Cubs won their World Series, so the oh, will the curse ever end, it's just kind of like the Major League Baseball playoffs happen, and then it's over, and nobody's worried about it when it's going on. Ian, who played in the ALCS last year? He doesn't know. But I bet you know who played in the NFC title game last year. Men's college basketball is becoming Major League Baseball. If you've got a team and your team is good, you'll care, right? So if you're a North Carolina fan and North Carolina is good, you will care. But as far as anybody else caring, I was texting everybody this morning. I texted Robbie as Joe was going on his rant about, the, uh, about just how great this men's college basketball hypothetical UT versus UConn game would have been. And I'm like, I asked Robbie, I was like, did you care about this tournament at all? Game. And I texted Caroline the same thing. And I was like, did you care about the tournament? She's like, nah, not really. And I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's that our attention spans are zero nowadays. I don't know if the NFL is just so popular that it's like NFL, 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 NFL. We have to fill every vacuum with NFL. I don't know if it's that the star coaches are no longer in the game anymore. Roy's not there. Kay's not there. Jay Wright's not there. Bobby Huggins isn't there. Patino doesn't coach at a good program. Calipari is no longer coaching at a good program. It's like, where are the star coaches? There's Tom Izzo, and his team kind of sucks. So that's out. I don't know if it's that the blue bloods aren't so blue. I mean, Alabama is not a blue blood. Connecticut is a blue blood, but for some reason, they're just, they're dominating in boring fashion, which may be another part of this, that they're dominating like the women's team dominated, which for all those years I was in women's basketball in Connecticut dominated, I thought that was bad for business. But this college tournament, this tournament sucked. And the games were fine. Like, I don't think the games, other than UConn, you know, steamrolling everybody, I don't think these games were any different. But it just didn't have the capture that it normally has, the men's NCAA tournament. And the other thing is, the women's tournament did. The women's tournament had that everybody must watch, everybody's talking about it. Everybody was talking about LSU versus Iowa. Everybody. Everybody watched South Carolina versus Iowa. Everybody. Everybody was talking about Caitlin Clark. Everybody. The men's tournament? It's like Connecticut won the title and people are like, oh, okay, yeah, who cares? And that is not good for your sport. Again, that's Major League Baseball. Oh, the Astros and the Phillies are playing each other in the World Series. whoop de freaking do I mean, look, I, and I know, again, the basketball bennies, the Joe Rexroads, the Dana O'Neills, the Jeff Goodmans, the Matt Norlanders, the Kyle Tuckers, the, you know, the people that just can't put the basketball down. Those people are like, what do you mean? It's a great game. Again, I'm texting Robbie. He's like, yeah, tournament bored me. Caroline, yeah, tournament. Pfft. Joe's like, this wasn't even one of the best tournaments, and it was an excellent tournament. I'm like, yeah, maybe ask everybody else who's not addicted to basketball. We feel the opposite. And this reminds me exactly of how the baseball writers like Peter Gammons and Tim Kirchin and all those guys, how offended they got 10 years ago when people said, dude, baseball kind of sucks. People aren't watching it anymore. It's like, how dare you? Baseball's a great game. Yeah, the days of John Miller and Joe Morgan and Sunday Night Baseball and Ken Griffey Jr. and those days are over. Women's basketball is on the ascent, and men's basketball sucks. And, then, and don't even get me started on the NBA. You know, I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons why women's basketball is on the ascent. 
One of them is that men's basketball, both men's college ball and the NBA, it's unwatchable. But, I mean, it's just the general interest of this tournament. I have never felt less buzz for a basketball tournament in my life than I felt for this one. And I'm worried it's only going downhill from here. I only worry that, you know, it's going to be like, hey, it's great, but, you know, we watched the game. We watched the NC State-Oakland game. It was a good game. We watched it, and then after it was over, we all moved on with our lives. And then there's not the urgency of, oh, my God, did you see? And I don't know how you get it back because Coach K and Roy Williams aren't coming back to college basketball. Kentucky's probably going to end up hiring some schlub. I mean, I don't know what you end up doing to get it back, but just no juice. No juice. It really has kind of turned into the NBA where they don't call traveling, and the best part of the broadcast is when they go to Charles Barkley at halftime. Bad sign for college basketball, and the Bennies will not admit it. That's my Rex rant for the day. 615-737-1025. Get your phones in on that. 615-737-1025. So Danny Hurley says no to Kentucky. Nate Oates says no to Kentucky. So who the hell is going to be coaching at Kentucky? Stillman and Company, 1025-1063 the game. Let's talk about White Bison. That's right. I love White Bison. I love Twice Daily, and I love White Bison. White Bison is my local coffee shop. It needs to be yours as well. White Bison has specialty coffee and so much more. So explore their selection of premium coffee blends, refreshing iced drinks, and food featuring fresh-made premium breakfast, lunch, and snack options. Download their app and join the White Bison Reward Program where you can place orders on the go and get rewards and earn free coffee. And you can even click the rewards on the app and it'll show you how close you are to a free coffee. It's, it's really awesome. Stop by White Bison and brighten your day with a sweet cinnamon beehive latte, an iced honey nut macchiato, or the vanilla rooibos tea latte. Find your perfect cup at White Bison where, finally, where it's finally crafted for you every day. White Bison and twice daily, what are you craving?
Coach, if you, even if this is not it, there is a place for you still in college basketball in my space. Well, I appreciate that, Kenny. And I, I am so happy doing this. I'm telling you this right now. I love doing this. I like being Kenny's coach, even though I'm not Chuck's coach yet. I haven't <laughs> earned that. I haven't earned that yet. But I love being Kenny's coach. And I, and I say this. Chuck, to your point about John running his course, what John Calipari has done at Kentucky, it's not just the recruiting, the final fours, it's getting guys to the NBA, taking care of their friends. It's their big blue midnight madness, having Drake come in, having the top recruits in the country every single year. Th that program is known worldwide, and it always was, but he took it into this, this new generation and did an incredible job. The guy that replaces him is going to be in a really difficult position to cover all the areas of college basketball. He's a college basketball genius. What he did in recruiting, and, and bringing in all those pros and, and all those guys that come back to Kentucky makes that program as strong as ever. Whoever comes in there is coming into a super strong program. That's so, a firm no, though? Was that a firm no? Yeah. On yes. the media. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Told you, I'm Kenny's coach, man. I'm proud right. of it. Yeah. Hey, you Stand Kenny's coach. Me. Kenny's going to Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> Jay Wright says no thank you. He's not taking that job. Danny Hurley said yesterday after the game, no, thank you. I'm not taking that job. Nate Oates put out a statement yesterday, said, no, thank you. I'm not taking that job. And the Grand Slam home run, no shot, can't miss Billy Donovan is not leaving the NBA to be the next coach at Kentucky. Let me say this to you right now with absolute certainty because I said today on Twitter, because someone was like, how do you know Billy Donovan is not coming out of the NBA to be a college coach. How do you know? And I said, look, I got a source that told me that Donovan's camp said he's not coming back. And people were like, oh, yeah, I've heard this one before. Ian, you just tell the people that my sourcing on this is probably pretty good. Sure. As far as these coaching searches of late are concerned. Okay. Well, you don't seem convinced either. Well, I mean. You know where it's coming from. I guess so, maybe. Then you don't know where it's coming from. Okay. Let me just say this. I know for a fact that Billy Donovan's agent has told people that he is not going back to college. I just know that. And so now the question is going to be, who the hell does Kentucky get? Because, I mean, I really thought Kentucky was the kind of job. And, like, look, at Louisville, I got it. Like, we are not Kentucky. We're not Duke. We're not Kansas. We're not North Carolina. And I know that. And so, I, I'm, like, we hire Pat Kelsey to be our coach. I get it. That's fine. You know, we hired the College of Charleston coach. Maybe he's good. Maybe he's not. It is what it is. But Kentucky is supposed to be able to put it out on the table, and then them want to jump to be the coach at Kentucky. And Danny Hurley's already said no, and Nate Oates already said no, and Jay Wright's not interested, and Billy Donovan. And not only is Billy Donovan not interested in going back to college, it is not feasible for Billy Donovan to do so because the transfer portal opens on Thursday, and, like, UK is going to have to get a team together. And Billy Donovan, they're in a playoff spot right now. So he can't leave what is he supposed to leave his team to go fill out a roster at UK and like Billy Donovan is not Bobby Petrino like he's got too much integrity he's not going to do that so who can UK hire like who really wants that job and here's what I think I've learned about college basketball now I can't say that this is the case for college football simply because as far as college football is concerned Alabama's job opening came available and they went and said Washington, and they went and got him. See, that would be the same as UK saying UConn and getting him. UConn can't pay what Kentucky can pay. Kentucky's paying their coach $9 million a year. Now they don't have to pay him. He leaves. Danny Hurley's making five. UK with a football program, they can pay $10 million for Danny Hurley. UConn can't pay that. And I have no idea if Danny Hurley's like, no, 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 I'm good at $6 million. I don't need $10 million. 
I remember one time Floyd said, ask Warren Buffett if he wants an extra two and a half million. I bet you Warren will say he does. So I don't know who's going to coach Kentucky, but here's what I think is now the case for all of college basketball. And when Bill Self leaves Kansas, they'll be in the same spot. It's almost become the draft. It's not exactly the draft because you get to pick your coach and your coach kind of gets to pick you. But you got to get the guy when they're at the low level. Like you got to get the guy before they become a star coach or else they're not coming. Duke just had an opening. They hired an assistant from within. Carolina just had an opening. They hired an assistant from within. Kansas hasn't had an opening, so I don't know who or what they would attract or could attract or who they'd get. But I noticed this with the Louisville thing that, you know, unless it's a a coach at Scarbini State or a mid-level guy at Mississippi State, there, there are no guys out there that are already at good programs that want to leave them. And I see Brad Underwood at Illinois as a guy that maybe could be on Kentucky's list. Brad Underwood's got a $20 million buyout. That's not happening. So I have no idea who the next coach at UK is going to be. But I don't even think in today's era where everybody apparently can pay everybody, I don't think they get Billy Gillespie to leave Texas A&M in 2024. Like, I think UK picks up the phone, calls Billy Gillespie, and Billy Gillespie ends up getting a raise at Texas A&M. Scott Drew's already gotten a raise this cycle. Scott Drew going to get another raise this cycle out of this? And so, again, I want it to be Bruce Pearl, but I think there's a chance that UK picks up the phone and Bruce Pearl turns around and gets a new deal from Auburn out of it. So I don't know who the coach of Kentucky is going to be. But mm. I heard Derek Mason. I love Derek. I, I heard Derek, though, with the craziest take I have heard in some time when he said that Cal is bigger than UK. I'm like, dude, Cal had the exact same resume. Like, again, he had better players than Tubby Smith did. He had the exact same results as Tubby Smith did at UK. The exact same. Won a title, made some Final Fours, won the SEC, made some Elite Eights, made some Sweet Sixteens, started to fall off. The fans hated them, and then they, they were out and took a lesser job. Tubby to Minnesota, Cal to Arkansas. In response to my Rex rant about how men's college basketball sucks now, Kyle says, I felt the same way about the NCAA men's tournament. I didn't really care. My friend group didn't even do a tournament challenge after years. He said he watched a quarter of the games. It didn't seem fun. There were times where I felt like I needed to watch, and I was like, eh, not as interested. Whereas, like, the women's games, the LSU-Iowa, and then the championship game Sunday, I was like, all right, women's basketball comes on tonight at 6. I'm watching. Gunner says Roy Williams said no to UNC also. I don't remember that. I remember Roy Williams was the head coach at Kansas. They lost to Syracuse in the national championship game. They asked Roy Williams outside the locker room if he was going to take the Carolina job, and he was noncommittal about it. That's what I remember. I don't remember him saying no. Maybe I remember that wrong because I was in the seventh grade, but I don't remember that. Texture says Patino should take the Kentucky job, LOL. Yeah, Patino. That guy, I, I cannot stand the Patinos. Mm-mm-mm. Chip from Mount Juliet says, you're 100% right about college basketball and baseball. Also add the NBA to that list. So here's the conundrum with the NBA. The TV ratings say the NBA sucks. I don't hear anybody talking about the NBA. I find the NBA to be incredibly boring. When I host national radio, I very rarely get calls about the NBA. I very rarely feel the need to talk NBA. And yet every time I turn on the TV, it's Stephen A. Smith talking NBA. And I'm like, these guys wouldn't talk NBA if it was bad for business, would they? Skip Bayless is always talking NBA. Fox doesn't have any NBA rights. Now, his ratings are in the freaking toilet. But still, like... 
I mean, I guess people care about the NBA. And then they say the NBA rights are going to go through the roof. I'm like, why? Nobody's watching? I don't think. 615-737-1025 is our phone number on the program. Coming up next, yesterday I pissed a bunch of people off. And I said the Titans had below average receivers. So you know what I did? I went through, if you're looking at the stream, I'm going to show you right now. I went through each team's receiver room and I literally broke it down as to, okay, who has better receivers than the Titans? What I came away with, we'll do next. I'm going to company 1025, 106 for the game.
Stillman and Company, 1025-1063, the game streaming live on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook Live. We are live in the uh, Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning Game Nashville Studios, Bridgestone Arena, Preds and Jets tonight. Barry Trotz in less than an hour on our program. Trevor in less than 30 minutes. So yesterday, I pissed a lot of people off when I said the Titans had below average receivers. The topic was, I think the Titans still have a need at receiver. I think the Titans still could use a Malik Neighbors or a Roma Dunze or somebody like that. I mean, you know I want Joe Alt, but I still think they have a need at receiver. And boy, people got mad, including our morning show that was like, but Jared, the Titans have Calvin Ridley. I'm like, you do realize it's Calvin Ridley we're talking about, not Calvin Johnson we're talking about, right? You do realize that. So instead of just saying, oh, no, 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 no. They've got above average receivers. Oh, no, 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 no. They've got, I decided to go room by room and say, okay, how many teams in the NFL have better receivers than the Titans? Because, again, I said below average, and then I maybe talked myself into maybe more towards average, but still, I, I think there's work to be done. So the three things that, that, kind of the three things, the way that I looked at it was talent number one. If you've got a dog, that is different than having Ridley, who's good, and Hopkins, who was that, but is no longer that anymore. Hopkins is still good, but he's not the DeAndre of old. So like, if you've got Justin Jefferson, you go to the top of it. The second thing is availability. If you've got guys that don't play, Sorry. And the third is depth. Titans do not have three receivers. Burks is unreliable. And Nick Westbrook at Keene is not good. So if you've got depth, that might make a difference here. So I went room by room. Miami, I say, is better with Tyreek Hill. And, and Ian, you tell me if you think these are wrong. Okay. AFC East, Miami is better with Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell. Yes. New England, Pop Douglas, Kendrick Bourne, no. Correct, no. Buffalo, Khalil Shakir, and nobody else, no. Can't go that yet. The Jets, I put a question mark by. Mm -hmm. I like Garrett Wilson. Garrett Wilson's dog. Mm -hmm. I mean, he is. Now, James, or, uh, now Mike Williams is always hurt, mm -hmm. and Alan Lazard kind of stinks, but. It's close. I put a question mark next to the Jets. Fair. We'll leave that there for right now. AFC North, Cincinnati, Higgins and Chase, better than the Titans. Mm -hmm. Baltimore, Flowers and Bateman, not better than the Titans. Probably not. Pittsburgh, Pickens, not better than the Titans. It's only one. Cleveland, Cooper and Judy, not better than the Titans. Okay. So only Cincinnati's better than the Titans there. AFC South, Houston's better than the Titans. Diggs, Collins, Dell. I have Indy as better than the Titans, and here's why. Pittman is better than both Ridley and Hopkins. Pierce, number two, solid. Not as good as Hopkins. They've got Josh Downs as their third guy. Your third guy is Nick Westbrook Akine. Josh Downs breaks the somewhat tie. Indy's ahead of the Titans. Jacksonville is close. I put a question mark, but I'll go advantage Titans over Jacksonville with Christian Kirk and Gabriel Davis. Did you, you find a third for Jacksonville? I did not look for a third for Jacksonville. Okay. I was I just wondering they who they have. Who any yeah. AFC West, Kansas City, no. Denver, Sutton, and Mims, no. Chargers, Palmer, and Johnston, no. Raiders, Adams, and Myers, yes. Okay. Do you have a problem with the Raiders? Oh, well, Devonta Adams is so good. Like I don't think Jacoby Myers is that great, but with Adams being that good I'll, I'll give it to you yeah like minnesota similar right where it's where it's uh osborne a addison well i was gonna say addison oh addison's good yeah i would give it the vikings but like jefferson puts them so far over because he's so good mm -hmm. so with that miami cincinnati houston indy and the raiders that's five teams and then we have a question mark with the jets so it's five in the afc that's better than you the nfc east the giants slayton and hyatt no no McLaurin and Dotson in Washington, yes. That's close. I mean, I think Washington's pretty loaded. I mean, Terry McLaurin's really good. They just have no quarterback play, and their team sucks so bad that nobody ever sees them play. 
Uh, Philadelphia, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, better than Titans. Mm -hmm. Dallas, C.D. Lamb, Brandon Cooks, better than Titans. Yeah. NFC North, Jefferson and Addison, better than the Titans in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Chicago, D.J. Moore and Keenan Allen, better than the Titans. It's close, but I think you have to give it to Chicago. Detroit, Amon Ross, St. Brown, and Jamison Williams, better than the Titans. Green Bay, this is another question mark because they got three. Yeah, they have uh, not so much like high-end guys. But they're all young. And good. And they're good. Watkins, Reed, and Dobbs. Yeah. I'm going to go Green Bay. Three and they're young, I'll go Green Bay. NFC South, Tampa Bay, Evans and Godwin, advantage Tampa Bay. Atlanta, Drake London, Rondale Moore, I'll go Titans. New Orleans, Chris Olave, Rashid Saheed, I'll go Titans. Carolina doesn't have anybody. NFC West, San Francisco, Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk, I'll go San Francisco. Seattle, DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, Jackson Smith and Jigba, that one's easy, Seattle. Arizona doesn't have anybody. And then the Rams, Cooper Cup, and Puka Nakua, I'll go Rams. Yeah. The Colts and Detroit, I think, are two on there that were pretty close. Oh, I think Detroit is a slam dunk. Well, Amon Ra's good, but Jamison Williams has not proven to be a legit number two yet. Well, I didn't put Raymond on there, but Raymond is better no. than any three you have. I don't know about that. Raymond's better than Burks. Raymond's better than Westbrook Akine. Maybe. Just because he was a Scarbini here doesn't mean he's not catching the ball there. He's fast. I mean... So again, by my count, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 teams that have better receivers than you, which would make you 17th. And then there's the Jets with Garrett Wilson. I want to say Titans, but Garrett Wilson is just so good. Like if Calvin Ridley is $50 million on the open market, what's Garrett Wilson? Like, Garrett Wilson resets the market. And Garrett Wilson, I believe, has just had some terrible quarterback throwing him the ball the last two years. I think he's kind of in that Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson class. So I'm going to put the Jets in there, too. You're 18th in the NFL. That is technically below average. You want to argue Indy, you can argue Indy. You want to argue Green Bay, you can argue Green Bay. You want to argue the Jets because Mike Williams never plays and Alan Lazard kind of sucked that first year, but Garrett Wilson's a dog. I know, you're excited. You got Calvin Ridley, you want to pump your chest, but you still got work to do at receiver. So big old mean bad Jared's not as wrong as you think unless you guys want to try to argue with me that you'd rather have Calvin Ridley and DeAndre Hopkins than Justin Jefferson or Jordan Addison or CeeDee Lamb and Brandon Cooks. Sorry. Average to below average is where you are. Your room could use improvement. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. 615-737-1025. And let me say the other takeaway that I had from this exercise, that you are not. We'll do that next. Stillman and Company, 1025, 106 for the game.
the Buffalo Bills are going to be a really an interesting team because of the Stefan Diggs trade and wide receiver Josh Allen. Yeah, you have some guys they like there, led by, of course, Khalil Shakir. But do they move all the way up in the top ten to get Romo Dunze if he slides down to that eighth spot, right? Do they move up? And these teams really want to move out of there, and is the compensation going to be good enough? Julio Jones, Atlanta moved up to get from 27 to 6. They get up a lot to get him, but they acquired a great number one go-to receiver on the best in the league in Julio Jones. Will the opportunity be afforded to the Buffalo Bills, and will they want to do that? Or will they want to move up into the mid-first, right, to get an Xavier Worthy, to get an Adonai Mitchell? Do you have to move? How far do they have to move up to get Adonai Mitchell? Is it four, five, six spots? It may not have to be that quantum leap, but it may be a leap from the late first, maybe up five, six, seven spots to get the wide receiver they love, whether it's Brian Thomas Jr. And I do think he could slide down into that 20, 25 area. Or at that point, Adonai Mitchell, sure handy. He's going to catch those Josh Allen fastballs. Adonai Mitchell doesn't drop anything. Xavier Worthy, we talked about with the speed. Xavier Leggett, big bodied A.J. Brown type. Who was the receiver that Brandon Bean targets? I got to believe, Field, the Buffalo Bills are aggressive and move up. Maybe not in the top 10 to get an Aromo Dunes, they say, but certainly up from where they are to get one of those receivers I just talked about around that 20 to 23 area. Rome Odunze, says Mel Kuyper Jr. So he's talking about the Bills moving up in the draft. So the one thing I did when I went through the exercise of seeing how many of these teams have better wide receivers than the Titans, some of these teams, and you're not one of them, but some of these teams just have god-awful receiver rooms. Buffalo. All they have is Khalil Shakir. Now look, I know some of that's because Stephon Diggs is an a-hole, but again... I mean, on Sundays in the fall, it doesn't matter if he's a nice guy or not. You don't have anybody to throw the ball to. New England's going to have the third overall pick at quarterback, and they're going to be throwing to Pop Douglas and Kendrick Bourne. Pittsburgh only has George Pickens, and he's an off-the-field concern, too. forgot they traded Deontay Johnson. Yeah, I said Carolina has nobody. They have Deontay Johnson, but they yeah. might as well have nobody. Um, the Giants, Darius Slayton, Jalen Hyatt, woof. Carolina has Deontay Johnson. Arizona has nobody. Denver has Cortland Sutton and Marvin Mims. Like, if you're Arizona, can you really pass up a wide receiver at your pick there, considering the roster? And again, to the point that Mel made earlier that we played, which was you move past three, I mean, it's not the same as the top three guys, like Romo Dunze. Um, who else is it that has terrible? Arizona's terrible. Oh, the Chargers. I mean, Palmer and Johnston. So, while, again, I don't think like, oh, Jared, wide receiver is fixed because we have Calvin Ridley, while I don't believe that, I will say this. I do feel pretty confident that you're not as bad as some of these other teams. Oof, oof, oof. Boy, a lot of people are texting me personally about picking the Colts over the Titans. Here's the thing. Well, is it two wide receivers deep or three wide receivers deep? Well, you don't have a third. So, if the other team has a third, then they get like a little bonus nugget. You know, it's like the Jets have three, but I think two and three suck, so I can't necessarily put the Jets ahead of the Titans, but one is so much better than one and two. Well, Pierce is not proven compared to Hopkins. But again, Pittman's the best of, the, of, the, of all five. The three of the Colts, the two of the Titans, Pittman's the best. But not by much. I'd say he and Ridley are probably in the same class, close. and then Pittman's yeah. availability puts him significantly ahead of Ridley. Ridley missed two seasons, dude. Yeah, well, I get it. One was for the betting thing, though, right? That's not injury-related. That's a bad thing. Yeah. Like, if you're stupid enough to do that, and I know he learned, I know, I know, I know, but he doesn't erase it. That's like Nicholas petit Frere when people are like, well, you know, Jared, he missed part of the season last year because of the gambling. Yeah, that's a bad thing. Like, that's bad that that happened. It's not good. And then they have three guys. Pierce is a legitimate NFL receiver. Downs is a legitimate NFL receiver. Burks, you know, I mean, he's good for four they do games need, a year. They do need a third guy, the Titans. They do. Like when Paul went on that rant about NWI last week, I mean, I don't think that it's enough to not take Joe Alt, but he is not wrong. They, they got to do better at that third spot than Nick Westbrook Akine. And you cannot count on Traylon Burks. Like, I'll put it to you this way. Last year when Traylon Burks met with the media at OTAs, and he didn't meet with the media yet at the OTAs, but I did see a video of him walking into the facility yesterday 
I saw a Traylon Burks that had been working out and had been, you know, was really, and I felt bad for him because he worked so hard. I saw Traylon Burks in this video walking into the facility. I don't know if Traylon Burks has been putting in the focus that he put in last year. I'll just leave it at that. One texter says, Jared, I know Levis is pretty much unproven so far, but are we taking into account the guy who is throwing these receivers the ball? I think for the most part, yes. In how many instances, though, would we say, oh, the guy who's throwing them the ball makes the difference? Like, I don't think that the guy who's throwing them the ball in Cincinnati makes the difference. Mahomes, Allen, and Lamar all have worse wide receiver rooms than the Titans. Who else is a good quarterback? I mean, that's pretty much it for the guys that are like those force multipliers. Herbert has a worse receiver room. Jacksonville has a worse receiver room, though I don't think much of their quarterback. I can't believe that Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup are just inventions of Matthew Stafford. So I do think we're taking that into account here. One texture said, fans are going to wear you out on this come October. Ridley's better. I mean, I hope. I hope the Titans, you know, are better. One texture said, but who's throwing them the ball in Indianapolis? Does that make you better or worse? Right? They had Gardner Minshew throwing them the ball in Indianapolis. He's a backup. But does that make it better or worse? And then let me say this about Richardson. I think Anthony Richardson, if they don't, leave, if they don't ruin him, I've always thought he's special. That's why I worry about them drafting one of these Brian Thomas Juniors or trading back and taking A.D. Mitchell or something like that where Richardson can just bomb the ball down the field to one of these guys. One texture said, how would you feel if the Titans signed Tyler Boyd? I would also prefer Alt and then a receiver in the second round than going receiver at seven. I mean, I, I still got to figure out what they're doing at right tackle before I tell you what they can do in the second round. But I'm a little surprised Boyd's still out there. I actually looked that up this morning when I was doing the receiver room stuff, and I saw that, you know, I was going through Cincinnati, and I was like, where did Tyler Boyd sign? And then I did a Google search for Tyler Boyd, and it was like every article that had come up, you know, in the news section of it was like, the best remaining free agents available. I was like, damn. Nobody signing Tyler Boyd? Well, he's got a limited role at this point, probably. An aging slot possession guy. Somebody signed Chris Moore. Yeah, probably cheaper, but yeah. One texture said, anyone who doesn't agree with you is delusional. While older, while older d hop and ridley is a solid combo it's not an elite combo by any means but the new offense with the new coach could change all of that we'll see i still now the thing about ridley that i like is that he can run you know that is one thing he can he can go deep you know boyd a lot of people linked boyd to the titans because boyd and brian callahan in cincinnati and i'm like but boyd plays in the slot and they need a guy who they can throw the ball down the field to, and Ridley is a deep target. Now, he dropped the ball a little too much last year in Jacksonville, but I'm going to chalk that up to the rust. But, you know, again, like guys like Richardson and Levis, they need guys who you can throw the ball down the field to. Brock Purdy doesn't necessarily need that. But these guys with these rocket launcher arms, they need it. Trevor is up next, 615-737-1025 here on our program. Trevor will join us. And again, the Titans brought in Malik Neighbors for a visit, J.C. Latham for a visit. What's it mean for the Titans and Joe Alt? Trevor will weigh in next. We'll do it here. Stoneman and Company, 1025-1063 of the game.
Stillman and company, we are only a couple weeks away from the draft. Who Can you not? I mean, oh my God, I'm so excited. But I am so excited to give something away because I've been promising that we'll do this, and so I guess I'll do it now. Be caller 5 right now at 615-737-1025. You'll win a pair of tickets to see Burt Kreischer at the FNM Bank Arena this Saturday. Good luck on that. So now the Titans are bringing guys in for their top 30 visits. They're getting towards the end of the ability to do that. Yesterday, Malik Neighbors and J.C. Latham paid a visit to St. Thomas Sports Park. Trevor Maddox joins us now in the program, presented by Houston Clinic Orthopedics, when experience matters, and ESPN Bet Sportsbook. So, Trevor, I want to start with this, which is... I listened to Rick Spielman, the old general manager of the Vikings, on, a, on his podcast, say that he thinks after the catch that Malik Neighbors is better than Jamar Chase. Now, he still says he would take Chase coming out over Neighbors, but then also says it could be either way between Neighbors and Marvin Harrison Jr. So I want to have the uh, great debate between Neighbors and Joe Alt. If the Titans end up on the clock at seven overall and both neighbors and alt are available, what is the what is the side of the coin that you're taking, Trevor? Alt. Alt, alt, alt. And I have absolutely no question about that. Neighbors is an elite touchdown score, at least he was in college. He's got plenty of improvement that he's going to have to do to translate that to the NFL. I think he'll be able to do it. He's a very good risk as a playmaking wide receiver. But given what the Titans have, given what the Titans need, I would go alt in a heartbeat over neighbors if they're both there. Trevor, do you think this is that same 2021 debate that Brian Callahan was a part of in Cincinnati between Jamar Chase and Penesul? I think in some ways it is, but I think that you've got you've to look at this team. I mean, the offensive line, they improved through free agency at center, but they are still woefully inadequate at both tackles. And when you look at that, that situation in Cincinnati, where Jamar Chase was there, Panay Sewell, who may be the best offensive lineman in the league right now, certainly he's one of the best offensive linemen in the league, left tackle out of Oregon. And Detroit could have, could have taken either one, well, actually, no, Detroit couldn't have. The Cincinnati could have. And they chose the touchdown scoring receiver. They chose Jamar Chase, right? And that left Panay Sewell to go to Detroit. Well, you, you can't say that Cincinnati was wrong necessarily because Chase has become one of the elite playmakers, touchdown scorers in the league. But when you look at that situation, look at it from this perspective. Joe Burrow, the Cincinnati quarterback, has been banged up his entire career. Now, some of those injuries had nothing to do with standing in the pocket with bad protection in front of him. I mean, he injured a knee while he was near the goal line trying to score a touchdown on the run. Uh, he injured a calf during training camp. But, like, those kinds of injuries, especially that calf, for example, kept him from being as mobile as he could be during the season. And a lot of quarterbacks are like that as they get banged up during the season. And he had to get that ball out of his hand super fast. Burrow has been banged up because his line has been awful. He is so great. His receivers are so great that he's been able to get the ball out of his hands and quickly and had success anyway for the most part. But Jared Goff, uh, he's, got, he's got one knee injury to his name, but really he hasn't been injured in anything significant that I've seen since 2021. Mm -hmm. And having Panay Sewell there to protect him, you've got a scenario where Goff for the Lions has better protection than Burrow for the Bengals. Burrow has better receivers. They're elite, especially at the top. The Lions receivers are very good. I don't think they're as good as Cincinnati's, but they're still very good. But the protection is dramatically better, in large part because of the anchor, Panay Sewell, at left tackle. So in a lot of ways, this is that same kind of situation. And it'll be interesting to see um, what coach has to, has to think about this situation, having seen the way an elite receiver and a bad offensive line played out for his quarterback in Cincinnati. Well, it's funny you bring that up, Trevor, because I was just looking it up while we were discussing this, which is in the 2021 draft, yes, Cincinnati took Jamar Chase over Panay Sewell and Brian Callahan, you know, is happy with that decision. And not all things are equal, but 
Cincinnati drafted a tackle in the 2021 draft in the second round, Jackson Carmen, and he's not very good. Detroit drafted a wide receiver later in the 2021 draft, and that was Amon Ross St. Brown, and he is very good. And I don't even think it's close between Sewell and Brown and Chase and Carmen, if we were to break it down that way, which again takes me to the Titans sitting there at 38 and saying, okay, if they take Alt, with this deep of a receiver class, do you still feel confident that they can get a receiver that can make a difference in the second, fourth, or fifth rounds? Yes. I don't think they'll get an elite talent like they would get at number seven if neighbors or somebody else falls to that point. But they will still get a receiver that will dramatically upgrade this receiver room. See, the way that they've handled free agency this year has been borderline brilliant, where they, they've added – solid players in their prime or approaching their prime that, that are going to be starters to upgrade those positions, you know, at center, at wide receiver, uh, at, I think, an inside linebacker. I, I, like, I like Murray at, at linebacker a lot. I think his potential is enormous if he can get himself straightened out from a mental standpoint in terms of executing his assignments instead of running around like an unguided missile. But when it comes to receiver, by bringing in DeAndre Hopkins a couple of years ago now and by bringing in Calvin Ridley, all of a sudden their receiver room has a deep threat in Ridley and a, a wily veteran who can work underneath exceptionally well in Hopkins. Now, Hopkins is not what he once was, but he still is very, very good if he's got support from other receivers so that he's not always being covered by the best cover guy on the other side. And so – they are in position in the draft that they don't have to take that receiver for a position of need. They are in position where they need to take a tackle. But if you look at what's available in free agency and tackle right now, you know, they've got some big names that are available, but those guys are largely incredibly injury prone and they would have to take a risk on somebody, maybe on a one year prove it deal uh, in order to get some veteran depth in there, which is not a bad idea anyway. Uh, at tackle, but they're going to have to build through the draft at tackle because of who's available right now. And so, you know, when you look at the, the, the Cincinnati conundrum, mm-hmm. where it was between Jamar Chase and Panay Sewell, they've upgraded the receiver room enough that there's somebody to throw to now. If they don't upgrade the offensive line, they're going to end up with a young quarterback who isn't as good as Joe Burrow was coming into the league and getting the ball out quickly. And Although I'm impressed with with Levis, but he's not Joe Burrow. He's not right now. If they don't give him extra time to throw, he's going to get pounded like Burrow has been pounded. And I think that if you do upgrade his offensive line and go with the tackle at number seven, whether it's Alt or Latham or whoever you want to put there, then the receivers that they do have will have extra time to get open. Trevor Maddich is with us. So to your point about J.C. Latham there, We know three or four quarterbacks are going to go, and we probably know that one or two receivers are going to go. And in the case that they may end up taking Latham at seven, I would assume that Alt goes, which means that one of these great receivers is available. Is there, do you think of bringing J.C. Latham in for, do you think J.C. Latham is a draftable player with the seventh pick, or do you have to trade down to take J.C. Latham, given where he probably falls on the board? Latham is draftable if you believe that you can overcome some of his technique shortcomings with coaching. You don't really have that with Alt. The things that Alt needs to improve from a standpoint of technique are things that are not that bad, and he's overcoming them anyway, and they're not weaknesses. They just need to become better. You know, where he's very tall, he's 6'9", and he'll lean over at the waist sometimes too much. doesn't really have to do that. He's trying to get his pad levels low, but he's still effective. Latham has certain things with his pass sets especially that I think can be coached up, but it adds a certain degree of risk. And if they, there are people, though, that from an overall prospect standpoint have Latham ranked higher than Alt as an overall prospect. And so if they took him at number seven, I would not be mad because what they would be getting is a Sewell and with a little coaching, could be very good. 
And so that, that's where I think you've got J.C. Latham. Overall, I think the quality of the prospect at number seven, he would be worthy of. And if Alt is gone, for example, by the time they get to number seven and, and Latham is there along with neighbors, I'd take Latham over neighbors. Wow. Trevor Maddox is presented by ESPN Bet Sportsbook and Houston Clinic or the Big Swing Experience Matters. Because this is the next question I'm going to ask you, Trevor. If Alt's gone at seven... Then what? We'll do that next. Trevor's with us, Stillman and Company, 1025, 1063 the game.
This is going to be an O-line centric building. You know, when it comes to our strength program, it's built around the O-line. You know, everybody else fall in line. And so uh, some people don't value offensive linemen. We do. Okay. And that will be shown in how we approach everything from how we stretch to how we lift to how we run the ball to how we protect. Uh, this is a place where O-linemen are going to want to come and play because it's an O-line centric space uh, where we're going to raise these guys up and make them feel great about what they do and what they have to offer and not push them to the side and make them the afterthought. They are at the forefront of our thinking. That was Andy Bischoff. You're like, who in the hell? Andy, Andy Bischoff. He is the tight ends coach slash run game coordinator for the L.A. Chargers. The L.A. Chargers put that on their social media yesterday and Titan fans, oh no, Jared Joe Alt's going to the Chargers. And I said, I guarantee they have no receivers. They have a left tackle. They have a right tackle. I guarantee that Joe Alt will not go to the Chargers at five. But I have been wrong before. Trevor Maddich is with us, presented by Houston Clinic Orthopedics, when experience matters, and ESPN Bet Sportsbook. So, Trevor, my first question to you on that front is, if Alt's gone at seven, then who? Well, then you're looking at the highest-ranked player. Um, and let, let me throw, well, a thought out there. See, J.C. Latham, according to most ranking services that I've seen, and according to me, just watching him on tape, would be a worthy pick at number seven, especially with Bill Callahan as the offensive line coach to kind of school up his pass sets a little bit, actually more than a little bit. But he's got light feet, and he's got the ability to school that up, and I like that. I really like Olu Fashanu, the left tackle out of Penn State. And I have no idea why the only buzz we've heard about him in in the recent days, really a couple weeks, has been, if anything, kind of negative. I I don't know why that is, because I think he's also worthy of that seventh pick. He also needs some coaching up more than Joe Alt does, but like Latham, Fashanu has the athletic ability to be able to receive that coaching and and grow very quickly into a, a solid Pro Bowl caliber tackle. So I'm fine with either one of those. But if the Titans feel like it's a reach for either one of those guys, at number seven, you, you just can't reach for a position of need. You just can't do it. Because if you do, we've talked a lot about, Jared, how you end up populating your roster with an overall lower level of talent. Mm-hmm. And so you've got to make sure the guy's worthy of that. Uh, and and let, me, let, me, let me just throw a name out there that hasn't been talked about as much as it should have. I'm sure you guys have brought it up. But Brock Bowers the tight end out of Georgia, most people have him as a top seven or eight prospect. He's got the size of a tight end, the speed of a receiver, and the moves of a running back. And at Georgia, with all the, the injuries that they had at receiver, teams were focusing their coverage on Bowers, and they had guys all over him most of the time, and yet he made catch after catch after catch and broke the first tackle and got yards after the catch. He is a matchup nightmare for defenses. And if, if Alt is gone and the Titans were to take Brock Bowers at number seven, they still have to deal with their tackle issue. But they will have upgraded the overall playmaking talent of their roster in a tremendous way. And then if they wanted to take neighbors if he's there, uh, then I, I wouldn't be fine with that. Or I wouldn't have too much of a problem with that. But I would rather take Latham than Neighbors in that position. Let me just say this about Neighbors. Neighbors is a great player. He's worthy of all the talk that he gets. His speed is his best feature, and he uses that speed by varying that speed. And it really throws off defensive backs. As he starts down the field, he slows up, and then he speeds up again. Then the ball starts coming in, and he hits that extra gear. He's fantastic at that. He's versatile. He can play inside and outside. But He's not a very precise route runner, and he telegraphs routes underneath. He'll stutter step way more than he really needs to, given his size and explosiveness. And in the NFL, guys will study him, and they will be able to take advantage of his telegraphs until he gets those coached out of his game. So I think he's going to be a great player, but he's not the perfect player either. Would you take, and this is just a quick one here, would you take Fashnu at seven over Neighbors? Fashnu is going to have, I think for most people, a higher, uh, excuse me, Neighbors will have a higher grade. I would take Fashnu. 
Mm. Trevor, what you know of Jim Harbaugh, do you think even though they've got Rayshon Slater at left tackle, they've got Trey Pipkins, who's an okay right tackle, and they have no receivers. They drafted Quentin Johnson last year in the first round. He looks to be a bust. Trey Palmer out of Tennessee, who they drafted a couple years ago, he's okay, but he's not a starting NFL receiver. They let Keenan Allen go. I just don't. I mean, I think that the Chargers are telling everybody they're going to take an offensive lineman or they're telling everyone they're going to trade down and Harbaugh's pumping up J.J. McCarthy because I think he wants Marvin Harrison Jr. And I think he's trying to get Marvin Harrison at five and he doesn't want anybody to know that. What you know about Jim Harbaugh from having covered the college game the way you do, do you think that it is out of the realm of possibility that Harbaugh does take Joe Alt given what he already has in the line and what he doesn't have at receiver? It wouldn't surprise me at all for Harbaugh to go with offensive line. Everything you said about Harbaugh playing against uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. when Harbaugh was at Michigan, Harrison Jr. was at Ohio State for all those years, uh, all that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. The Chargers set up their offseason to need to draft a, re- a playmaking receiver with that fifth pick. And so it makes perfect sense to do that. But Harbaugh built Michigan from the inside out. He built Michigan like an SEC team. And the reason the SEC has been the dominant league for most years in the last 20 has been as a league, they've got more big guys that can run in depth than anybody else in college football except for the top of the Big Ten. And Michigan took the top of the Big Ten and made it better than the SEC last year as he won the national championship on both sides of the line. That's why from a personality standpoint, it wouldn't surprise me at all. If Harbaugh said, look, we'll find receivers later in the draft, Uh, we'll find receivers other ways, there's still some pretty good free agent receivers out there that they might be able to get on a one-year prove-it deal and see him go with building that offensive line. So if he did it, it wouldn't surprise me. Would it surprise you? You know, again, everybody's telling me now that J.J. McCarthy's a great prospect and that they didn't need him to win the game at Michigan and he did what he was supposed to, but he's 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 got the talent to be able to do that. If that's the case, would it surprise you if Harbaugh uses Justin Herbert, even though he's making $50 million, similarly to how he used uh, McCarthy? Because, I mean, if I've got Justin Herbert, and I've already got a left tackle and a right tackle, and I'm paying him $50 million, I want him to have his number one guy, whether it's Harrison or Neighbors, I want him to have his number one guy, and I want to bomb the ball out there with Justin Herbert. Yeah, they, Herbert certainly is hoping for that. And they're good enough on the offensive line, especially on the, age, on the edges, as you mentioned, Jared, that they're not like the Titans. Where if the Titans don't shore up the edges, they're toast. I mean, they're toast. Whereas the Chargers are not in that position. And I think the receiving room of the Titans is actually better now after what's happened in this offseason in L.A. than the Chargers receiving room. So, it, it, you know, they, they need to do that. I would just look at this, too, that I don't know Justin Herbert personally, but I wouldn't want to make him think that the team doesn't care to give him weapons. Remember what happened with with Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay, mm-hmm. right? When they drafted his replacement in Jordan Love in the first round, instead of drafting him a receiver or somebody else that would help him on offense maximize his ability as a an MVP caliber quarterback who's still playing at the highest level to get them back to the Super Bowl, they went ahead and used that pick on somebody that had no chance of helping Aaron Rodgers at all. And Aaron Rodgers is like, I'm done with you people, right? And so I don't know that that Herbert would be that kind of personality at the same time if you've got a guy you think is a franchise quarterback, you want to make sure that that guy is happy with what you're doing for him. Trevor Maddich is presented by Houston Clinic Orthopedics when experience matters and by ESPN Bet Sportsbook. Trevor, it has been told to me you will be a part of our draft night coverage right here on 102.5 The Game. Yeah, absolutely. I can't wait. It's going to be a ball. I'm going to bring a fire extinguisher to make sure that, you know, if you, uh, if you go ballistic on something, we can make sure it doesn't cause a, a big disaster. Well, Trevor, I mean, Ian will tell you that that is usually like an annual thing that happens around here is there is usually a a Jared Stillman meltdown. Trevor, great stuff. Appreciate you as always. 
Thank you, Jared. Yep, Trevor Maddich joining us on the program as he always does. And let's put him down again. We said eight votes. Ian, Trevor, TD, Chris Sanders, Fitz, Corey Curtis, Chad Withrow, and the fans. Eight votes on neighbors or alt if they're both there at seven right now. Ian and Trevor are both Joe Alt. I like my company. There you go. Coming up next, the Predators need one point tonight in order to clinch a playoff spot. But it'll be depressing if they lose in overtime. It's like, well, hey, you lost in overtime. Congratulations. So they need a win tonight. Barry Trotz joins us next, as he always does. Stillman and Company, 102.5, 106 for the game.
Stillman and Company, 1025, 1063, the game streaming live on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook Live, live from the Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning Game Studios, Bridgestone Arena tonight. The Predators take on the Winnipeg Jets. One point means the Predators are headed to the playoffs, but it would kind of suck if the Predators were to lose and then celebrate after having lost. So just go ahead and win, get the two points and go ahead and get in the playoffs. We are joined, as always, by Predators General Manager Barry Trotz. So Barry, I wrote down on my little notes to ask you how exciting it is to be able to clinch tonight, but I'm looking at you right now. You got like this <laughs> serious look on your face. You got, I, I don't know if you're like nervous or anxious or, or what it is, but there's something up with you tonight, by the way, Barry's presented by Gary Forsakura. Oh yeah, no, I'm fine. I'm just, I was trying to get my tickets to, uh, to my wife so she can come to the game tonight. <laughs> And that, I've had more problems with that than I've had. She got to log in. Else. She got to sign up. She got to download. No. She got to uh huh. All right, tonight you sat down with us this time last year, and we knew that the playoffs were probably not going to happen last season. And you said to the fans, "Hey, fans, be patient with us. Like this is a process. This is yeah. not going to be." And here you are tonight with an opportunity to clinch. And I talked about in 2022 when this team made the playoffs and got swept by Colorado. They made the playoffs, but it didn't feel like that team could do anything. This team has proven over the last two months it feels like they can do something. So when you look back on that and you sit in the position you're in today, what do you, how do you feel about how this has all transpired over the last year? Well, I think, um, you know, there's, there's so many good stories. Uh, there's some... Uh... You know, we've gone through a, a full gambit of, you know, a, a five and ten start. And, you know, it's, it could be a long year. And, and we haven't done that for a long time where we haven't been battling for a playoff spot. And like you said, even when I started, this this might be, you know, a couple-year process. So, you know, uh, it, just enjoy the ride, whatever the ride is this year. And it's been uh, one that uh, has had some downs early, but uh, a lot of a lot of upside on the, on the back end. And now you, you see the growth of of the team, the culture, the uh, the style of play, all those things. I think that you know, in the back of my mind, and then same with Bruno's mind is there's a, there's a certain uh, group of of uh, players here that we feel very comfortable with. There's a, a culture that we we're creating and continuing to to uh, build on the culture that was already here. So, um, you know, we're just trying to get in the playoffs. I'm looking forward to uh, getting doing it. Uh, the right way, like you say, let's just get a win um, and do it, uh, you know, not back in where, you know, we got to rely on St. Louis to, to lose a point, but let's just go get it, go after it, and then let's see what happens in the playoffs. There's some terrific teams. I mean, there's Dallas and Colorado and the Winnipeg Jets, and you can just go down, up and down the line. It's a great learning tool. When we, we were, when I was coaching uh, in the early days before we even made the playoffs, the best teacher was the Detroit Red Wings. They were the gold standard in the game. They're winning cups. They were in our division, and we had to be ready every night. And we don't grow as a franchise unless we play the Detroit Red Wings at the, the height of their glory, if you will. And uh, that's how you learn. So uh, you learn against the, the best. So uh, we got a great test tonight, and then hopefully uh, if we can get in the playoffs, we're going to have a... Uh, another completely uh, different animal to deal with, whoever that may be. So I'm going to ask you kind of how the team exceeded your expectations for this year, but not so much the, okay, you know, well, we thought that this team might be this level, and they did. What I mean is, is the why. Why did it happen? Why did this team come together? Why did this team go on the run that it had? Why is this team as competitive as it is when you were preparing us for the possibility that it might not be, and what do you attribute that to? I think uh, what it is is a, a couple of factors. You've got uh, uh, you've got good coaching, you've got good leadership, uh, and you've got good culture. And and then those three three things were brought together with a common focus. We were we became a pretty good hockey team. What do you make of kind of the last week? Right, you play a very competitive game against a bona fide cup contender in Boston, end up not winning the game. Then probably don't have your best game five on five against St. Louis, but the goalie plays great. You're good, you know, in special teams. You end up winning that game, which was a huge, had to have it for the standings with St. Louis. And then again, the two games, which both of which could have gone either way over the weekend. You could have won on the island. You could have lost at Jersey. And so you end up going two and two on the week, but it was kind of 
a lot of different play and different, you know, results didn't necessarily equal the play of last week. What did you make of it? Yeah, no, I, I think you're, you're pretty accurate. Like I said, when we came back, uh, we've had the, you know, the, the foot on the gas for you know, a long time. And, you know, when it, when, it, when it does finally end, and it did end in Arizona, it usually ends in a clunk. And then we played two really good teams, and I'm, uh, you know, a team in, in Colorado who was, you know, cup worthy. And then I thought the game against Boston at home here, that was a playoff game. That was a man's game. That was dirty, nasty, fast. It was high execution, high commitment. And we just came on the, on the back end of a, uh, of a result. But I would play that like a, we walked into the room after the, uh, after the game. And I said to Bruno, you play that game, that team plays uh, that game, but you're going to win nine out of ten games. And uh, we just didn't get the result. And then that didn't realize that that piece, uh, two things against St. Louis, I think the, the Bruins took a piece of us because we had gone and we were trying to recharge the batteries. Um, and then it was the first time that we were the hunted. And that's a different pressure. And I didn't think we had our best, but our goaltending was good. Our special teams, which lost us the game, uh, won us a game, mm -hmm. and uh, you, what I what I really liked about that game, you, you know, we didn't execute, we didn't do a lot of things that we usually do. We weren't as physical as we usually are, um, but when it mattered most, the guys that lead this team stepped up, and it was guys like Yossi and McDonough and O'Reilly, and then you go down the list. Guys stepped up in those big moments. They needed a block shot, they blocked the shot. They needed a big penalty kill, we got the penalty kill. They needed a, a, a really good power play that came through. So all the things in those key moments, we, we were able to respond, and that is very encouraging. And then uh, obviously we went to New York. I thought we played very well on the, uh, in, uh, in uh, Long Island. I, I thought the first maybe 10, 12 minutes, I, I didn't like our game. It was a little too loose. They were getting too many chances. Matt Barzell was, had too much space. Um, and then we started locking it down. We started tightening it up. We started getting on their defense. Um, and they, we, we had 92 attempts on their net, which I think might be close to a franchise record. They also had, they, as they called it, Barry Trotz hockey. They, uh, they blocked uh, 33 shots. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they they you know, cocooned it pretty well. They, they, they kept us to the outside and then Farlamov was really good in the big moments, so um, I thought we deserved at least a point and maybe a win in, in uh, Long Island. And I thought uh, in New Jersey, I thought this was the same thing, a little bit of a slow start, a little bit loose. And then as the game went on, we, I felt we were taking it over and over. And then what a wild overtime. You know, yeah. what, 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 are, what are general managers thinking about changing overtime? You know, that was a good example of why we don't want to change it. Mm -hmm. So, um, But at the end of the game, you know, we got big saves uh, in a shootout and an important goal when we needed it. As a coach, Barry Trotz is with us here, presented by Gary Force Acura. When you see UC Soros playing the way that he's playing, I remember early in the year you made a comment on the show where you said that the analytics department told you that last year he stole 20-something games and that you said, you know, this year he's only stolen one or two, and this was early in the season, and I kind of got the message that, hey, you know, he hasn't stolen the games that... It does feel like he has really found, you know, the UC Soros that makes him an elite goaltender lately. As a coach, going into the playoffs, how do you view that when you had a Pecorine back there or you had a Braden Holtby back there or you had one of those guys that you say, okay, this guy may give you a chance every night. How did you view that? And maybe how does that change the way that a coach can approach the playoffs or develop kind of a plan to attack a team like a Dallas or a Vancouver's plan? Well, I think, number one, it gives, you, it gives you confidence. It gives your team confidence that your goaltender can be a difference maker. You know, you, you, when you, you know, look at any sport, you know, line up quarterback to quarterback, uh, mm. you know, defensive line to defensive line. We do it in hockey. Line up top centerman against top centerman, goaltender against goaltender. Okay, where do we stack up? Where, where can we take, you know, a piece of this team, their strength away, uh, and, and change it. You know, goaltending is one of those that can take it away almost in every position. So um, it gives you confidence. It gives you a belief. If you don't have goaltending, you're, you're holding your breath all the time. And if you want to hold your breath through a whole playoff series, you're not going to usually do very well. So 
I, I think that's really a key for us. And then Kevin Lankinen has done really had an excellent year as well. I think we're going into it. Our goaltending looks like we're in good shape. So um, we've got to stay healthy and we've got to just continue to, to play hard and, and find a way to, to play to our identity. When we play to our identity, we're, we're a good hockey team. And, you know, the, the thing is we play, the, you know, at a, at a certain level every night. Some of these, uh, I'll say what I call elite teams that have those high end, um, you know, four or five, uh, say, forwards or, 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 you know, those high, you know, high center men and a winger like, like Colorado. Some of those guys can elevate their game, to, you know, that you haven't seen all year, and then you're in one. You yeah. know, you're going to have to, you know, I call gang tackle those, those superstars. So, um, you know, but I, I think we have a, a good chance because of the fact that every night we play, we've been playing playoff hockey, and when it comes to it, there's no pressure on us. I mean, if I'm, whoever's playing us, all the pressure's on them. I'm not, I'm not saying that just to, to be coy or, or to, to start the... Uh, the playoff talk already, but uh, it's true. No one expected us to be here, except us. And uh, you know, we're probably not going to be a favorite in the series or any series we play. So, you know, let's let's play free, let's play with uh, with no pressure, and let's go after someone. Barry Trotz is with us. Do you have in your mind, and when you look at that, it looks like it's going to be Dallas or Vancouver, and it it looks like depending upon if you are the first wild card or if you're the second wild card. Do you have a desire for one over the other? You know, if you go to Dallas, you're going to be playing one of the best teams in the league, but you're not going to have the travel. You're not going to have the all the way up to, you know, Western Canada and back and customs and everything else. Uh, you know, there's a familiarity with Dallas being a division opponent, and I actually think it's a good thing that the last time you played them, they kicked your ass, and that they're going to think, oh, well, we beat them 9-2, and we, you know, beat them in the season. And I actually think that's a good thing yep. because your guys are going to remember that they got beat 9-2. And we saw what happened to them after they got embarrassed 9-2. So I think that's a good thing. But then at the same time, on paper, Vancouver's not the team right now that Dallas is. And Dallas is on a huge heater. So how do you kind of break those two down? Well, I think you, you, whatever way you want to spin it. I mean, we can look at uh, our last game, uh, division opponent. You know, we can use all those things. At the same time, you can go to Vancouver and just, just being in Canada, there's a lot more pressure on them. Uh, they're a good hockey team. I watched them last night actually against uh, the Golden Knights and they, they beat the Golden Knights last night. So um, no matter who you play, it's going to be a, a really good series, I, I, I would hope, um, because of the fact that they're, they're good teams and I think we're a good team. Um, and I think you're going to have to look at them all differently. But I, I know if you go up to Canada, there's more travel, all that. Uh, there's probably more pressure on the Canucks to, to win because of the, the Canadian market and Vancouver just as a as a market itself. Um, well, if you want me to ramp up the pressure, I'll ramp up the pressure. Right. I don't have a problem with that. No, they're, they're, I think both fan bases okay. will ramp, ramp up the pressure. I just know in, in Canada, there's, it's 24-7 uh, Vancouver Canucks. Uh, we're down down south here. There's you know, you got baseball, you got different, different well, we things We got left happening. tackles we got to, you know, argue about <laughs> and whatnot. Barry Trotz is with us. How much do you make of the travel? How much do you say, like, okay, you know, I'd rather us not have to do the travel and that, like, how much, how important is that to you? Well, I, it all depends, uh, I think, probably on your, on your key guys, how much we're, we're used to the travel. Um, uh, these players are a lot younger than I am. I know I don't like traveling anywhere. Uh, you know, as they get older, but uh, at the same time, uh, I think when you get in the playoff series, there's so much excitement and adrenaline flowing that, you know, it, it's it's fine either way. I remember back in the day when we had back-to-back -back series with Anaheim and then Vancouver, and every time you got in the plane, it was, you know, 3,000 miles. So um, you just got to, you, you live through it, and, and the adrenaline gets you through the playoffs. Barry Trotz is with us. There is a stat that I saw in a Sportsnet article today that, I guess I'm not surprised by because I've watched the games. I couldn't tell you what the stat is. But according, this is from a Sportsnet article. Since the 18-game point streak, during the 18-game point streak, you guys were allowing 39% of the shots from the slot. Since then, 44% from the slot. But the inner slot shots over the past six games are 8.17 per game compared to 4.78, almost double the amount of inner slot shots. Do we know why that is, and how do how does that get corrected? Well, I think it's just it's sometimes it's energy, 
as much as a, anything, also your opponent. I mean, there's there's some teams that get into the, you know, we just finished playing uh, Colorado and Boston and, you know, the, the, and, yep. and uh, Jersey's the team that gets in the inner slot a lot. So it could be your opponents. It could be energy not being able to get back. It could be decision-making with the puck. There's a lot of good things. And I, you brought up an article today. I saw an article today. I, I can't remember what it was, but it was talking about uh, the goaltending. And we're talking about how we play. And it showed every team's... Uh, expected points based on their goaltending uh, and then what they have now. We're basically at a, at a 99 point uh, pace uh, in terms of winning and our expected points were 100 uh, in, in terms of that. So uh, this year I would say that our, our play and our goaltending have come together mm -hmm. and it's not one-sided where there's some teams that are you know, a little more one-sided in, uh, in where they are in the standings. So uh, I'll have to pull that up for you, but I, I did see it on, uh, on Twitter today. Barry Trotz is with us here on the program. You're on Twitter? Once in a while, yeah. I get some uh, places that I followed, obviously in New York and, and Washington and Nashville. So I still got my Twitter account. I can't believe everything I see in there, that's for sure. So is it, a, is it a, like a Twitter account that's like incognito, or is it like a... You know, oh, I've never, I've never gone on, on social media in any, any way. But then how do you go on Twitter? Well, you go on it, but I've never written anything or anything. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. No, never. Okay. Zero, zero point zero. Barry Trotz is with us. All right, now I'm going to put you on this hot seat for this one. I'm going to put you in the shoes of either the Dallas Stars or the Vancouver Canucks. They draw the Predators in the first round of the playoffs. If you were the coach of that team, getting ready to play this Predators team, what they've been through this season, what they've done over the 18-game point streak, what they've done since then, the goaltending. How would you feel as a coach getting ready to play the Predators in a playoff series? Well, I'd be very cautious. I, I would talk about their, their strength, obviously their the key, key personnel. Um, be ready for a battle. Uh, they are relentless, uh, so you can't let your foot off the your focus off the uh, off the battle so all that being said I, I would prepare that way that no matter what you're uh, what you're going against is it's, it's going to be a hard series Barry Trotz good luck tonight again I it won't be as much fun to celebrate making the playoffs if this is an overtime loss I mean I'm sure you'll take it but it it will not be as much fun as much as it will be a win tonight for you guys I, I know winning beats losing. <laughs> and if, if, if you're not first or last, all those, all those things. So I'd like a win. Yeah, I always like to earn it the right way. Uh, but, you know, we need a point, and if we can get a point... And it's great to see you. Good luck tonight. And I know that tonight and on Saturday, Saturday's the last home game, I feel like... Every time you've come here, you've always said something about the fans. And this season, I, I certainly, having been in the building the last couple of weeks, have felt kind of the buzz in the city surrounding the fans. And I think that that has, has really been palpable around here. Well, it, it is. And I, I'll say this. when we uh, Hopefully, we can get to our destination, and obviously, in the playoffs. But I, I want our fans to, to have good energy. Because you don't, you're not playing the game. The players are playing the game. Don't get worked up. Just cheer and enjoy the game for what it is. And I'll tell you, that's really positive energy. Because I know the players can feel the uh, anxiety uh, of the fans when, the, you know, when they, they have that. Uh, and I've been in some of those places like New York and Washington that has a lot of anxiety at times. And they let you know it. But I think the players, these players deserve... Uh, your positive energy, you've given it all year. And so when we hit the playoffs, we're going to need that positive energy to give us just that little bit, 2 3% to get us over the hump the time and time again. I feel like that might have been targeted towards me a little bit. Barry Trotz, as always, <laughs> you can follow him on Twitter at Barry. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Barry, great stuff. Again, good luck tonight. Thank you. Barry Trotz is presented by Gary Forsacker, Stillman and Company. We roll along 1025, 106 through the game.
Stillman and Company, we're live at Bridgestone Arena. Again, the Predators are in with a point tonight against the Winnipeg Jets. Special thanks to Barry Trotz joining us on the program as he always does on a Tuesday. And I have one big takeaway from that conversation that I guess I probably wasn't expecting. And that was, he, Ian, I don't, I don't know if you picked up on this or not, but he talked about how, hey, there's no pressure on us. There oh, yeah. will be pressure on Vancouver because they will be in Canada and they, they will expect that Vancouver will win, but mm -hmm. there's no pressure on us. Mm -hmm. I've thought about that. And then he said, hey, fans, we need you guys to be positive. You know, the fans, the, the team can feel the anxiety. Don't get worked up if things don't go right. You know, support this team. You guys have had their backs all year. And I'm like, I'm listening to that. And I think those two things run together. You know, again, the mental approach here of like, hey, man, we got nothing to lose. Nobody thought we'd make the playoffs. No one's going to pick us in order to, make the, to win in the playoffs. Nobody out there is talking Nashville Predators. Don't worry about it. We'll be okay. And then the, hey, fans, like, get behind this team. You know, they, they need your support. They don't need you to go crazy on them. And I wonder what that means. Like, I wonder why the message from Barry Trotz is, hey, we, it, it's like he's trying to take the pressure off, right? Like, by saying, hey, there's no pressure on us. We got nothing to lose. And then saying, hey, fans, don't, don't get on the team. You know, support the team. Don't get on them. They need you. It's like he feels like he wants this team to, hey, guys, don't get too caught up. Don't get stressed out. Don't get – and is that a worry thing or is that just a, in all of his years of coaching and in his experience, he has felt like this, that his teams have performed better when they have been free and easy as opposed to handling expectations. And my gut tells me, and I don't know this, my gut tells me it's his experience because in Washington they won back-to-back -back President's Trophies – and they lost in the second round of the playoffs, and I bet that it was just misery. And I think back to the Predators in 17 and 18. In 17, nobody, except for the local blogging community here, nobody expected the Predators to beat the Chicago Blackhawks in the playoffs. Then they did. Then after they beat the Chicago Blackhawks, nobody expected them to beat the Blues and so on and so forth. The next year, the Predators won the President's Trophy, and I was telling people, you know, during the, the run that they went on this year, that I said, this is the most fun I've had, being a fan of the Predators since the middle of 2018. Because once the, thing, once the playoffs came around and the Predators were trying to exercise the demons of the year previous when they got to the Cup Final and they didn't win, and they won the President's Trophy, and then in came Winnipeg, that was a miserable experience because I had so much anxiety about, like, like I, I was more worried about losing than I was excited to win. And when you're not expected to win, it's like, yeah, everybody can just be excited and see what happens and everything else. So I think he's trying to take the pressure off the team just based upon his experiences and I get it. That being said, as much as I love Barry, I'm not going to not get on the team. <laughs> I mean, if they're not playing well, like, again, we want to win. We don't want to almost win around here. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. So now the question is Vancouver or Dallas. And Barry was kind of, you know, noncommittal about, oh, well, you know, there will be pressure on Vancouver and there's some travel, but those guys are younger and whatever. I have a very definitive answer for who I want the Predators to play. We'll do that next. Hey, it is playoff time in the NBA, NHL, baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel Sportsbook, my official sportsbook app, is your place to bet on every game. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, bucks, win or lose. You can bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. So what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash JGM and make your first bet an automatic win. That's FanDuel.com slash JGM. JGM. 
That's FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. 21 and over in President Tennessee. First online real money wager, only $10 first deposit required. Bonus issues, not withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after a seat. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call the Tennessee Red Line at 1 800 889 9789. What in your mind would clinching a playoff spot tonight mean in terms of the scope for this group, the expectations heading into the year, all those things? Yeah, I think it's pretty important. I think from top down, Barry Trotz, Andrew Burnett, they they want they have made it such an emphasis about playing well at home, and I think just being able to do it at home when you have the opportunity, that's probably the biggest thing. The other thing is, I think they want to do it with a win, because I I really just I'm. Starting to, I was listening to you guys talk about it recently. Like, I'm starting to think that the you need to avoid Dallas at all costs. I mean, Dallas is just like such a machine, and if you can finish in the top wild card spot and get Vancouver, even with the travel, that's just. I think that's pretty important. It's not like um, it's still not a great matchup. I mean, obviously Vancouver's got a really good team, but but man, if you can do this with wins and just go ahead and solidify that first wild card spot, that's going to be pretty important. Okay, that was Alex Darty on the uh, morning show. Alex Darty from the Tennessean. And so he says, avoid Dallas at all costs. Robbie and Joe, Dallas is on a heater, man. I don't know. I don't think you want to play Dallas. Let me say this. I want the Predators to draw the Dallas Stars in the first round of the playoffs. And I know... Right now, Vancouver's got their issues. You heard Barry say, oh, no, you know, it's uh, this one. We got, uh, you know, they, Vancouver beat the Golden Knights. And so I don't care about that. Here's why I want Dallas. Dallas has a lot of good players. You know, Dallas is kind of transitioning their roster. Kind of similar to what Boston's done over the years, where Boston transitioned their roster from the Bergeron, Marshan, Krejci, that crew to Pasternak and Charlie Coyle, like this group they have now. Now, obviously, Marshan's been a big part of that, you know, in both groups. Zaka, Poitras, you know, that group they have. Dallas has done that. They've got a lot of veteran guys with playoff experience, including Matt Duchesne. 
But to me, Dallas has a shot at winning the President's Trophy, supposedly. And if Dallas does that, when you're that good, and Barry talked about the pressure being all on the other guy, when you're that good, all of a sudden, all you're thinking about is the cup. That's it. It's all you talk about. It's all that matters. It's all that anybody cares about. And I'll never forget the Predators in 2018 when they won the President's Trophy, and there was all this talk about, well, they're going to get Winnipeg in round two, and that Winnipeg Jet team, I mean, that's going to be, and everybody was worried about the Winnipeg series, and because everybody was worried about the Winnipeg series, Predators went six games with the Colorado team that did not belong on the ice with them. And the Predators, at this point, are better than that punch and Judy Colorado Avalanche team was. So when Dallas wins the division, which they're going to, and is the top team in the Western Conference, which they're going to be, I'd rather play Dallas. I think Dallas is going to be looking ahead. Dallas isn't worried about you. The last time they played you, they beat you 9-2. They think you suck. And that's fine. Let them think that. All I know is the Predators responded to that 9-2 beatdown by going and getting a point in 18 straight games, playing the best hockey they've played in years around here. So I know even though the Predators' last game is on Monday, and Dallas's last game is on Wednesday, so the Predators will have basically a whole week to think about this Dallas series and everything else. I get that. But what I feel good about is I feel good about the fact that the Predators are going to go into that Dallas series as underdogs, and they will be humbled because they have been humbled by the Dallas Stars, whereas Dallas is going to be overlooking the Predators. They're going to be thinking about Colorado. Then there's the travel and the fact that it is an hour and a half flight to Dallas. Vancouver, it's a lot of time out there. And then there's the fact that Vancouver has Elias Pettersson and Dallas does not. And so I know on paper, Dallas looks to be the better team. Vancouver has goalie injuries. Dallas, Jake Ottinger, their goalie, is a legitimate, proven number one goalie, and he's playing like it. He's on a heater right now. But I just think Dallas is ripe for the picking. Just the combination of not really looking at you as a threat, having smoked you before, having beaten you in the playoffs a couple of years ago. I think that Dallas is a team that would take you lightly. And it's like I asked Barry Trotz, I said, okay, you're getting ready, let me put you in the shoes of the Predators or of the team that's going to play the Predators. What would you think? He's like, oh, yeah, I think they're relentless. I think they play hard. I think they've got goaltending. I think they've... But will the Dallas players really believe that? Will they really feel that way? And I don't think they will. So I want Dallas. So when I hear the morning show and Alex Darty and everybody else say, oh, avoid Dallas, ah, I don't care about that. I want the stars. I really don't want Vancouver. I don't want the travel. I think Vancouver is very fast. I think the second round matchup, which is going to be probably Vegas or Edmonton, is a bad matchup for you with their speed. I know Vegas is behind L.A. right now, but still. There's all the travel. There's the customs. There's everything else. And I'd just rather play Dallas. Donovan texts into the text line. Our phone line is driven by WilsonCountyHunter.com and says, I love the Predators' chances when you consider the pressure will be on the other team and that the Predators are a fantastic road team. You know, I don't want to say, like, throw all that stuff out when you get to the playoffs. But I would say throw some of that stuff out of the playoff. During the season, on the road, these playoff series are kind of like their own beasts, right? It's like baseball. You know, you get to the playoffs, and then who knows? As an Atlanta Braves fan, I grew up, they won 14 straight division titles. They won one World Series. And there were all these little moments in game, like Eric Gregg's strike zone in 97. 
might have cost the Braves a World Series. Or, you know, an injury to Marcus Giles in 2003 might have cost them the World Series. You know, it's just so hard. And then, on this run they've been on the Braves, they've won all these division titles, and the one World Series they won was with their worst team. Robert Nashville says, what is the point of winning a championship if you're ducking all the good teams? If you want to be the man, you got to beat the man. I think there is some truth to that. The question is, do you want to play them later or now? I just want to duck the bad matchups. I want to duck the bad matchups. For me, that's Edmonton. Tesher says, Jared, you want to play Dallas for the psychological and travel reasons, except that you were forgetting that they literally have to play the game. I don't care that the Braves always blow it in the playoffs. I'd rather not play that team of superstars. Well, it's not like Vancouver's... I mean, Vancouver has 104 points. And Rick Tockett said last week their goalie would be back. Vingen texts me and says the Stars have eight players with at least 20 goals. No other team has more than five. I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about that, and I'll tell you why. Because... I'm worried, in my experience in the playoffs, it has not been death by a thousand cuts. It has been losing to the big boy forwards. It has been Taves, it has been Kane, it has been Blake Wheeler, it has been Kyle Connor. And look, Jason Robertson's really good, but I, I mean, look, you play Edmonton, I don't want any part of McDavid or Dreisaitl. I don't want any part of those guys because they'll take over the series. I mean, I remember Shifley in here in that playoff series and I couldn't stop them. So the other thing too is the Predators have played Dallas this year. And like I went to the game, Ian, it was either around Christmas or New Year's. I can't remember. I want to say it was around Christmas. Yeah, I think it was around Christmas. The 23rd or something like that. I went to the game and they were up by a goal with a minute left and... I walked out thinking, like, game was over. I'm like, they're going to win. Dallas pulled the goalie. And when I got across the street, as I got across the street, I, you know, was walking by the Omni, and they had on the screen that Dallas had taken a 3-2 lead, and I thought, wait a minute, they were just up 2-1. And I know the Predators went to Dallas earlier this year and beat them. And then the 9-2 game, you know, that was the look-in-the-mirror game that I think they desperately needed. So I want Dallas. But I tell you this as I tell you that I want Dallas. I think it's probably pretty likely you're going to get Vancouver. And then here's the other thing that may not matter. The difference between Dallas or Vancouver. I really, really hate the late night starts. And if you go to Vancouver, every game's going to be at 8 30 9 o'clock maybe even later than that if you go to dallas you're going to get a handful of 8 30s but you might also get some seven o'clocks in there and i hate those 8 30 playoff starts hate them i hate them and i don't want any part of that Texture says, wouldn't you think playing in the Pacific is better? Winnipeg will lose to Colorado. And if you play Dallas, you have to play Colorado. I'd rather take the chance with Vancouver and then hopefully play Vegas. I mean, Vegas is pretty good. And they did just win the cup last year. And I assume, and maybe I'm wrong for assuming this, I assume they're getting Mark Stone back if you play him in the second round of the playoffs, right? Probably, yeah. I mean, the whole point with Vegas is they exploit these Fakakta IR rules where they just decide, like, oh, yeah, he'll miss the rest of the season. We'll put him on long-term IR, and then when we get to the playoffs where there's no salary cap, then we'll bring him back in there. And so Vegas is pretty good. Like, I wouldn't want to play them. Predators game day is next. One point. Win, you're in. Lose in overtime, and you're in. We shall see. Predators game day is next. Let's talk about Window Nation. That's right. April is here, and if your windows will not open for fresh air or seal tight to keep out pollen, bugs, you name it, then Window Nation is who you need to talk to. I had Window Nation out to my home, and it was a wonderful experience where I literally said to him, I'm like, what windows need replacing? 
And Window Nation said to me, they were like, your windows do not need replacing. And I said, really? They don't need replacing? They said, no, they do not need replacing. And that's how I know that I can trust Window Nation. And I can tell you, when it comes to Window Nation, you can trust them. And when it comes to replacing your windows, you'll save a boatload of money with Window Nation. Because for every two windows you'll buy, you'll get two windows for free. And there's no interest or payments for 24 months. Again, for every two windows you'll buy, you'll get two windows free. No interest, no payments, 24 months. Do not miss out. Call 866-90NATION or visit windownation.com to schedule your free in-home estimate. Again, that's 866-90NATION, windownation.com. Predators Game Day is presented by T.J. Anderson Homes of Benchmark Realty online at tjandersonhomes.com. Get your house seen, heard, and sold with T.J. Anderson. T.J. Anderson Homes of Benchmark Realty, my agent. I actually talked to T.J. today. And I know T.J.'s fired up because the Predators, with one point, will enter the 2024 NHL Stanley Cup playoffs. The Winnipeg Jets are 47-24-6, and six, good for 100 points. They have clinched a spot in the Stanley Cup playoffs. The Predators are 45, 29, and four. Good for 94 points, 95 gets you in. We start with the coach's take. Here's Andrew Burnett. Same model, let's just move forward, straight ahead, and, and keep our game tight. And every night is a different challenge. Tonight's gonna be a tremendous challenge against a team that's as good as they're in the league. Um, we have to do a little bit better job trying to get inside, and this is gonna be a great test. You know, the island was one. This is a, a team that's even higher than the island. And 
for us to have success going, you know, further on, we need to be better in certain areas. And tonight will test us, and hopefully we're up for the challenge. Let me say this. Here's what I want to see out of the Predators tonight. I want to see the Predators kick somebody's ass. That's what I want to see. Because when they were on that point streak, that's what they were doing, right? Colorado came in here, and they beat them. What, they beat them max 5-1? They beat them 5-1. They go to Winnipeg, they beat them 4-1. You know, the, the game on Sunday, you know, that's an either-way kind of game. The game against the Blues, that's an either-way kind of game. And I know their losses have been the same way, like that's an either-way kind of game. But this is a good team, and I want to see the Predators put their foot up their tush tonight. And then that will give me confidence that, hey, they really are right there with these playoff teams, and if they play their best hockey, they can beat these playoff teams. Taking a look at the standings, as far as the Predators are concerned, the uh, Predators have 94 points, which is good for the first wild card spot in the Western Conference. Now, here's the deal. If you finish with the first wild card spot, you're going to Vancouver. If you finish with the second wild card spot, you're going to Dallas. Vegas has 92 points, so they're two points behind you, but they have a game in hand with 77 games played. You've played 78. If you win tonight, that'll put you at 96. You're not going to catch Winnipeg, but it probably helps you earn that first wild card spot. And if you're one of these people that's not me, which seems to be everybody else, and you want to go out west to play Winnipeg and, or Vancouver and all that, then you want them to win. I mean, I want them to win too. I'd rather play Dallas. But again, that's your look at the standings. And we are at the point now where we're kind of scoreboard watching around here where it's like, okay, if you win, what else needs to happen? The first thing is making the playoffs. You just have to get a point and then you're in. But the other games of note today that matter to you really don't exist because L.A. and Vegas apparently are off today. L.A. is at Anaheim? It doesn't say it right here. Oh, there it is. L.A. at Anaheim tonight. Well, L.A. is going to win that game anyways. That's it for us. Max has the pregame show. That's coming up next. Stillman and Company. Everybody will see you all tomorrow too.